show begin. <laughs> Good morning. It is uh, Thursday, August 10th. I'm Commissioner Ed Rothstein. Um, apologize for the delay. However, uh, we are ready to go. And as always, before we start, why don't we uh, stand for the Pledge of Allegiance in a moment of silence. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we have uh, a couple of uh, recognitions during Priority Carol, but prior to doing that, why don't we uh, go around the dais and see what's on our minds and uh, some of the activities that have taken place, uh, some very big activities, but amazing how we move through them. But uh, why don't we start? Um, Commissioner Guerin, why don't you uh, kick us off? I'm sure. Thank you. Good morning, Carroll County. I, I know we're a little pressed for time, but I think it is extremely important to mention. I don't. I suspect the other my fellow commissioners will mention this as well. But uh, on Monday, the county was hit by really an historic storm, and in the southern part of the county, we were probably lucky. We weren't as untouched, particularly in my district, but. It's fair to say that I don't think anybody really anticipated the magnitude of it, and it hit during rush hour. And we don't have enough time, and I don't have enough time, um, to mention everybody and everything that went well and everybody who contributed and everybody who's still out there working really hard, whether it's the sheriff's office, whether it's our county staff, it's emergency road operations, DPW. I mean, I'm going to leave somebody out if I try to do that. But I think it would be important to mention that uh, our, def our Department of Fire and EMS and our volunteers that are still running the stations, the chiefs are still volunteers, the presidents, the boards are still volunteers, they're still out there working hard every single day. They executed a tremendous response that I just want to make sure people in the county are fully aware of. They responded to at least 200 calls after the storm hit on Monday. Uh, and everybody knows, watching the news, uh, it involved people trapped, propane leaks, fallen trees, multiple injuries, life-threatening injuries. People were transported to shock trauma. 100 responses for down wires, fallen trees, and at least one significant fire. All those 14 stations and we do have 14 stations. We're staffed with multiple units. And um, it, 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 just, it just was an extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary response, and it's still ongoing. And the chief, Chief Robinson, the director of Fire and EMS, wants me to make sure that everybody's aware of all the players that were involved and are continuing to work hard, whether it's the Emergency Operations Center, our director Hawkins, the Emergency Communications Center, uh, his lieutenants and his staff working overtime. You know, the, the far Department of Fire and EMS really is, in theory, it's, it's really only 61 days old. So for them to turn like they did on Monday and uh, accomplish what they did, again, with the stations and the volunteers that are, have always been there for us, is just an amazing story. And it, the story's still unfolding and there's still some chapters to be, to be written, but it was historic and it was bad. And our response in the county was nothing less than extraordinary. And I just wanted to highlight the incredible work of our stations and our fire and EMS and our Department of Fire and EMS personnel. Thank you very, very much. It's amazing we didn't lose anybody. It's true. It's just absolutely amazing we didn't lose anybody. And that's a uh, testament to all of them and our sheriff's office and everybody else who pitched in and the, and, the, and, the, and the people of this county. We got some really smart, common sense people in this county. That's what we're known for. So that combination is a good one. 
So from, uh, from everybody in my district, in my family, in the county, I want to say thank you for what you did and what you're still doing. That's it. Yep. Very well said. Tom? Thank you. Um, just kind of echoing uh, Commissioner Guerin's comments, I'm not going to mention everyone that he did mention, but incredible, uh, significant storm to say the least uh, as many know with Westminster specifically on 140 we had 34 vehicles trapped with 47 occupants amazingly no one was injured or killed in any of that um, myself Commissioner Kyler and Commissioner Rothstein Monday uh, met with the governor and lieutenant governor as well as their staff they were up here touring uh, various locations and we met with them for some time uh, very good meeting uh, you see pictures on social media and they really don't do it justice of how it just incredible the damage was and uh, to Commissioner Guerin's point the fact that we were all very blessed be it the public getting together and working together to try to move tree branches working in you know BG&E the folks that came in from out of state that are here helping I know we're constantly hearing about BGE but there are other people that are here as well uh, I want to thank them uh, thank everybody you know as well as uh, you know Westminster City was was heavily involved there's a lot of uh, issues within Westminster with power being out and some other challenges and you know the the City Council and I were in contact uh, you know Westminster Police Department their their uh, departments within the city it was a collaboration it's what we do best in Carroll County we work together uh, obviously no one expected this but I think we have come out as best as we can it's it's very appreciating that uh, the governor and lieutenant governor and their and their staff were up here and interacting with us and I think we'll see some some good things come out of that as well um, uh, it was just you know all, all my colleagues and I were we were in constant contact that evening and it was well as staff and it was just it was a very long night but it was a good night I mean we we were glad nobody was injured so that was that was sort of the priority without question that day so if there's any takeaway I think it's just the fact that we're very blessed and uh, you know we get things done here so I'm, I'm very glad to see that we were able to get through this and to move forward um, a couple other things I will mention uh, somewhat briefly on a few other quick topics uh, last Thursday was the uh, biz challenge oh by the way uh, Chris could you bring that other one back up for a sec mm -hmm. so the BGE mobile uh, command center is over at the uh, the mall in Westminster they're there to assist so if anybody does have concerns they were there yesterday uh, from 9 to 7 I believe they're from 9 to 7 as well today by all means stop by reach out they're here to assist you in any way they can to try to get uh, power restored and resolved so uh, please do reach out to them I know there's been a lot of folks and we've all interacted with people in the community that are you know still without power and they're working as quickly and as efficiently and as safely as they can to restore that but uh, you know please try to be as patient as you can I know it's tough you know after a couple hours it gets brutal but uh, they are working around the clock to get this done for us and for the community so I just want to thank them and as well as the uh, folks from out of state that are here assisting as well um, last Thursday was the uh, Biz Challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, as always, a great event. Uh, incredibly tough. I'm glad I'm not one of the uh, individuals that has to pick who those finalists are. Uh, I will say that uh, I almost was debating whether there was going to be a sweep of all three uh, prizes at one point after everybody had given their pitch, but uh, the winner was a 17-year-old uh, student from Westminster High School, Derek Day, and his uh, teacher, Emily uh, Burns, who works at Westminster High School, and it's a, uh, it's a uh, product, call they're calling it LDOT, it's an acronym, it means Long Distance Object Tracker. And uh, what it's doing is it's utilizing artificial intelligence to verbally identify objects in the camera's view. So for people that have uh, are impaired with vision, this is something that could, you know, be a, an absolute game changer. And, uh, you know, I'm not somebody that usually s uses words like this very easily, uh, but it was incredible. Uh, I was blown away. Um, without question, I think this young man's on to something huge. Um, I'll go so far as to say he might be our next Bill Gates. I don't know. But uh, invest uh, now. Might be. <laughs> but uh, I do think at some point, if, if it's possible, I haven't mentioned this to my colleagues, I would love to have him in sure. just to present because I think, you know, when we can, it's always great that we bring in, the, you know, people in the community. And we get to share some of these amazing talents and gifts that they have. Um, it was a great event. 
Also, uh, this past weekend, I, I think Chris has a picture from the, uh, the veterans event we were in attendance mm -hmm. at yeah. with uh, Babylon. Um, so we were at the Babylon Vault Reese Across America Mobile uh, Education Exhibit. That was myself, Commissioner Rothstein, Commissioner Vigliotti. I uh, have to give uh, credit to Angelica Da Vinci for the photo. She's there in the very patriotic dress. And this was us in the uh, line as they were doing the pinning for the uh, Vietnam veterans welcome home pinning. Um, they received a number of different objects, uh, items, be it uh, challenge coins, certificates. It was very moving to get to interact with many of these veterans that in, in many unfortunate cases didn't get that appreciation when they came back from Vietnam. Um, it's always humbling to be involved with anything with any veterans, but I thought with that group that day, given the way some of that had played out in the past, I thought that was uh, just a very special moment, and it was nice to be with my colleagues at that. And just real quick, since you have the picture up, this gentleman in the tan yes. um, is a submariner from World War II, uh, who was also there. Um, very, there were, we had, I believe, two World War II veterans. Uh, right. And I swear, I feel like this was a month ago, not just a few days ago. But sorry, I just wanted to throw that out there. One gentleman was 99 years yes, old. That was right, Mr. Right. Price. Yes, he and was that's the submariner. Mr. Price, yep. right there. Okay. Absolutely incredible. I apologize. No, no. And then uh, obviously we have uh, Carroll County Restaurant Week. So uh, you know, look online, get out, uh, support your local small businesses. Always an opportunity and good thing to do. Um, another thing we have coming up, or actually right now, we have the Best of Carroll. Uh, voting via the Carroll County Times. Uh, that's another good opportunity to support local and recognize them. You can vote for a wide array of who the uh, choice awards are for that. Um, also, we have Maryland tax-free shopping, so good time to get out, buy things for school, and uh, other things as well, and take opportunity of that. And uh, last, but I will mention this, it was uh, very interesting. I learned very recently that Old Westminster Winery was named by Baltimore Magazine as the uh, 2023 Baltimore Best Winner and awarded Editor's Choice for Top Foodie Field Trip. So I think anytime we can uh, be seen in other regions, and especially Baltimore Magazine, I happen to know the gentleman that uh, owns that magazine personally, but it's great to see Carroll County on the map in Baltimore Magazine. So congratulations to uh, Old Westminster on that. And uh, like you said, I think we've had about a month and yeah. less than a few days, but uh, thank you. What, honestly, that's the way I feel, but no, thank you. Um, Commissioner Kyler, Kenny. Thank you, and, and yes, and I'll touch on the storm also, but uh, uh, I think we talked in the office yesterday. It seems like uh, Monday was about two weeks ago or something it's it's uh, and it's awesome the way it was handled but I'll, I'll get to that I want to briefly mention the fair again I mentioned the cake auction cake sale last last Thursday but the livestock auction was Friday and it's just great to see all the families there all the volunteers all the people working all the ag community and business community uh, bidding up uh, hogs and steers and lambs and goats and and I forget a, a gallon of milk went for a lot of money <laughs> a, and a couple eggs a chicken a turkey it, it's just amazing and uh, if if you didn't get there this year try to go there next year or it'll be well well worth it um, I had a virtual Hall of Fame meeting the day after the storm it was interesting because some of the committee members were sitting in their car trying to do the meeting because they had no power or internet in their house but um, I just wanted to mention that another Carroll County and well kind of Carroll County and um, is being inducted um, on November 5th in Annapolis Michael Duffy who's CCPS will be inducted into the Hall of Fame and what happens there's a uh, a meal in Annapolis and an induction there but simultaneously in Stillwater, Oklahoma, he will be honored and, uh, and his stuff displayed there. And I think it's also, but it's been a number of Carroll Countyans get in that and uh, we have a strong wrestling condition, uh, tradition and uh, it, it's, it's just great. Um, back to the storm quickly. Um, two things I wanna mention and, uh, and yes, uh, uh, the, the BGE, you know, they've been awesome. Uh, our 
Carroll County crews have been awesome. And uh, we talked about it a little bit with the governor. Um, one of the concerns is, and I know some people still have trees in the way, some people still don't have electrical service. These people are working hard, but for probably weeks after we all have our service, they're still going to be cleaning up branches and trees and and uh, poles and whatever. So uh, they're not done, and uh, it, it's uh, I'm I'm sure they're more than willing to do it all. But it's uh, it's a long period of time, and we got to make sure they don't get too burned out um, doing it. And the public is uh, very patient as the storm hits and, and going on, but uh, re recognize what these people were doing long after we have service and, and we're back going. Um, in Hampstead, and many of us heard about, we were so blessed that there weren't a bunch of serious injuries. And I didn't realize this was in Hampstead, but um, one lady almost lost her arm and almost lost her life and I won't have all the facts straight, who'd have thought, but I think it was an off-duty policeman that chainsawed the branch so he could get her to Hampstead Fire Hall. Um, Amanda, the one that lost her house a couple weeks back, was one of the ones that came up from Upico, and essentially the off-duty policeman, Chief Robinson, I think, was there at Hampstead, and they used... Um, some of the resources that they've just acquired in the last month or so to to help blood clot and probably kept her from losing an arm and as importantly probably kept her from totally bleeding out so uh again that's just one example of mm -hmm. what so many people in carroll county have done and we were, were blessed we didn't have accidents um and injuries worse than that when you see some of the photos of uh of trees and poles and cars you just wonder how people survived and not to make light of it um i cannot imagine we talked about it at home mom and dad and three teenagers trapped in a car for three or four hours while sparks and water are doing and Rhonda corrected me but i said i think after about two and a half hours i might have told one of the kids to jump out and just see how it works <laughs> um, it, it's that's a long time to sit there the and, lowest uh, enlisted get out there <laughs> yeah yeah and and more power to them um hampstead carnival um monday night they had their damage too mm -hmm. they fixed it they were open tuesday hopefully we're going to see some decent weather please come out and support them um, we walked uh, the grounds last night, and uh, it's always plenty of good food. And uh, the local Lions Club, the local fire company, many local groups are there selling chances. So get out and support them. But um, that's what it looked like Monday night. And uh, and I can't believe it. Those, if you see some of those blocks that were holding down the corner of the tents, I think they weigh a couple hundred pounds, and they were literally lifted off the ground and moved by the storm. And then lastly, I want to thank my neighbors. I have no photos. There's one of the blocks being put back. Mm. Um, I want to thank my neighbors. Rhonda and I decided about an hour after the storm to go into Manchester. She was worried about a niece and, and one of the businesses. And we got about a third of a mile, and we saw trees down. But we also saw two pickup trucks, two guys with chainsaws, about maybe eight other guys adults and uh, young adults i i want to call them teenagers but i think that's more a function of my age than theirs they were probably in their 20s and so Rhonda followed us with four-way flashers and we cleared shock road number one to water tank road and then uh, another neighbor showed up with a bobcat because uh we had a couple driveways probably blocked and he pushed the big trees out of there and then as we went on to Manchester to check on family, um, they started working on Young Road. So I apologize, I have no pictures. Um, I'm not gonna do a list of names, but, and I'm sure we weren't the only road in Carroll County that um, neighbors jumped out and opened roads. We had two cars trapped between two set of trees and then about 
a dozen cars while we were cleaning lining up and and needing to get through and uh they all got through and i i think i told a couple of people in public works we opened the roads but there's a lot of stuff i caught myself there's a lot of stuff to clean up and we didn't do any of that and i only saw one tree on a line and we stayed away from that one but we uh, we opened a road in that spot but we we didn't think we should be bg and e and get into that but it's just amazing how people come out and like i say we, we didn't even talk much it just everybody was working and uh it, it's amazing and uh that's why i love carroll county <laughs> thank you absolutely Commissioner Vigliotti, Jill, what's on your mind? Thank you very much, Commissioner Rothstein. Uh, like everybody else, I'll touch on the storm in a moment, but first I want to begin by saying that I was grateful to attend uh, yesterday evening's Board of Education meeting. Uh, Superintendent Dr. McCabe, Board Members Herbert, Battaglia, Savigny, Dorsey, and Whistler, as well as the school system and teachers are all set for the coming school year. Uh, they're dedicated, they're ready to go, they're good people, uh, and they're gracious and grateful for the ongoing close and cooperative relationship and communication between both of our respective boards. And they're looking forward to our next joint meeting at the end of this month, as I know that we are. And uh, of note, they are down to 22 classroom teacher vacancies. Uh, over the weekend, along with uh, Commissioner Rossi and Commissioner Gordon, I was thrilled to be able to participate in a welcome home pinning ceremony for Vietnam veterans at a Reeds Across America exhibit hosted by the fantastic Babylon Vault Company in New Windsor. Uh, there were two World War veterans there, uh, as has been mentioned, both of them in their 90s, who were on hand to offer respect to heroes who served during a time in American history when our men and women in uniform were not treated with the respect and the decency that they deserved. I was also grateful uh, after that to see, uh, I'm sorry, I was also grateful at the event to see uh, both awesome mayors of New Windsor, Neil Roop, and Mayor Christopher Miller of Tawnytown, uh, as well as Delegate Eric Boucher. Um, we're all certainly happen, or happy as well to see the phenomenal Angelica Prestia, who is the young woman in the dress there. She's a resident of New Windsor uh, who devotes her free time to caring for the war memorial and parks in New Windsor, as well as supporting our veterans, law enforcement, and first responders however she can. And so I want to say thank you to her for providing the uh, photographs that you're seeing now. Uh, later on, uh, after this event, I had the uh, opportunity to attend the 19th anniversary of the Tawnytown History Museum, uh, which showcases and preserves not only Tawnytown's history, but the history of amazing surrounding communities such as Detour and Keymar. I was thrilled, obviously, to see uh, uh, Mayor Miller there, as well as Tawnytown Councilman uh, Jim McCarran, uh, as well as members of the Tawnytown Heritage and Museum Association. Uh, now, uh, turning to uh, the storm, uh, everybody remembers last week we uh, celebrated National Night Out. Uh, the citizens of our county turned out in force to support our law enforcement at the local, county, and state level, our corrections, our first responders. Mm -hmm. And with the uh, storms uh, that battered the county on Monday evening, all of them came out to support the rest of us. You know, I want to thank our sheriff and his deputies, uh, law enforcement at every level, our first responders, our firefighters, our EM EMTs, volunteers, and professionals, emergency management, county employees, road crews, power company crews, and our citizens, uh, all of them who have been working tirelessly to s help see the county through the aftermath of this storm. You know, I, I really do pray that God blesses them all in their work, and I thank God that things were not any worse than they ended up. I also want to ask everybody to keep in their prayers anyone who's been affected by the storms. You know, many of our friends and neighbors who have been impacted are going to need help and assistance, and, and so please reach out to them. Please reach out to churches, community groups, volunteer organizations, and others to see how you might be able to help. And I also want to say thank you to the uh, Carol Observer, Informed Carol, and other online uh, uh, news outlets for helping to convey news and information about the uh, storm as it was happening. Uh, and last but not least, uh, as everybody knows, the uh, Board of Commissioners agreed to postpone the grand opening events for Charles Carroll Community Center due to the storm. Uh, the ribbon cutting and open house are going to be this Saturday, August 12th, beginning at 9 a.m. and ending at noon. Everybody is welcome to attend, and we hope to see you there. Uh, the address is 3719 Littlestown Pike in Westminster, Maryland, and that's up in the Silver Run Union Mills area. Uh, and Commissioner Rossing, that's all for me this morning. Thank you. Okay, I appreciate it. Um, Excuse me, Sheriff, I see you in the back. If you want to come up to the table, I am going to talk a little bit about the storm if you have any comments. Um, when uh, 
we started getting hit very hard with the storm, the sheriff. I felt immediately reached out to myself and my colleagues up here at the dais sharing what was happening and I truly appreciate that. And you were giving us a play by play, you know, uh, situation as you were seeing it on the ground. And, you know, I did, there were really three C's to this, the collaboration, communication, and the calmness. And um, the collaboration that you had with uh, state police, with uh, the local jurisdictions, especially with Westminster uh, police, you were sharing with us um, what was happening. Um, the communication doing just that. But like Commissioner Guerin said, the calmness that we were able to maintain, we being you and uh, your colleagues, for all those that were in those vehicles trapped for four plus hours um, was just, it, it's incredible. And I'm gonna get a little bit more into a little bit more of that, but what, what are your thoughts? And we talked that night and I, I text and, and the public, I, I, I guess knows this or not, but when there's incidents that take place that affect all five commissioners, I usually text all five of them at the same time and obviously this is one of those things to keep you up to date or if there's something that's happened in your geographic area i go back and forth with you to keep you up to date on those things and this was um an unusual storm i've seen so many things i've lived in carroll county for 50 years i've never seen anything quite like this um i think what was remarkable about that particular incident is that um, I know, Kenny, you would have thrown one of your kids out or told them to get out. Um, I probably would have, too, but nobody got out of their cars. And um, it would have likely instantly been tragic had they done that. And then the, the ability for us to go back and forth and, and communicate with them and the state police and BG&E and everybody that collaborated rather quickly to, um, to get the word out was remarkable because everybody stayed calm. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of, of, of chaos, and you would think the way it looked, there would, there would be nothing but extreme chaos. And so um, painstakingly working through that and coordinating with the state police. You know I'm a retired captain with the state police, so it was easy for me to communicate with those folks. And then ironically, one of the governor's deputy chiefs of staff is a retired lieutenant with the state police, a gentleman that I'd worked with for years. So we're able to communicate, and, and I reached out to you guys and let you know that he was coming up, and then he diverted, and, and uh, um, we went back and forth on that, and then, um, and then the next day. And then getting people around, and the, one of the remarkable things about Carroll County is that um, we need 140, there's no two ways about it, but people know how to use um, the roads without hitting 140, and, and they can get around without, without using 140. And it's important that we were um, on those back roads and on those roads that, uh, that we're gonna see a, an abundance of traffic so that we could keep a close eye and make sure that there were no incidences. And so we did. And uh, everything, I think, was as seamless as, as you could possibly make it with communication with, with my office, state police, first responders, uh, Chief Robinson, and then, and then the five commissioners. And um, yeah. I, I, I told you guys, I think, in a text that it's, there's nothing like it. I don't, I've, as a state trooper, I've worked in every single county in this state. Mm -hmm. I don't know anyone that has the relationship that, that, that we have with one another um, going back and forth. And if there's people out there that don't have power, I promise you, when I get power, you will get power. <laughs> I will be the last person in this county. I know this because I have been for 23 years. I'm in that deep run, Grand Valley, Band Hall Hill area, and I would give a shout out to those people, that, but they can't see me because we don't have power right now, but, uh, but, but we understand that and we're just grateful that, that everybody's okay and that we'll get our power sometime soon. So um, if, you're, mm -hmm. if you're upset about the power, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to make arrangements myself to, mm -hmm. to figure it out. So, so don't be too upset, it's coming. Could, could you comment briefly on our businesses? I think, again, because we're Carroll County, um, I mm -hmm. think it was very little vandalism, very little theft, but I think your staff's presence there probably made a difference mm -hmm. with that. That was the, one of the first things we thought about after 
the uh, vehicles were were uh, unoccupied and people were safe was that we knew that there was a large swath of businesses along 140 big box stores, Hoes, Home Depot, Home Depot. Um, the, all, all, we knew that there could be a potential problem if we didn't um, keep an eye on those establishments. So between my office and the state police, and 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 I I tell folks I I want this to be done and they they do it. And so um, uh, I, I've got a wonderful staff of people, and between us we came up with a plan to make sure that we kept an eye on everyone of those establishments. I did get calls from a number of those establishments um, thanking us for, for being in their parking lot and keeping close track of their stores. It, listen, it, um, I'd like to think nobody's going to seize the opportunity, but the reality is that there will be, there will be people that seize that opportunity. And I think I said quite clearly that um, uh, my jail had electric and there was room in it if you decided you were going to come up or come into <laughs> Westminster and do something stupid and we would we would snag you up and put you in it and yeah. we had How accommodating yeah we were very accommodating uh, thank you for the big generator that you guys pay for um, but but we had none of that absolutely yeah. none of that and it and it and it is remarkable and that's a testament to the community that we live in and absolutely and yeah that's the, uh, but it's always a, a fear and a worry that that there will be vandalism or there will be thefts but there sure. was none of that you know again the uh, um, the collaboration I mean was just unbelievable and um, really the the, um, the community working together you know again I don't like using word constituents it's about neighbors family friends community um, there was a hundred and twenty county roads that were blocked uh, either by trees and or power lines county roads our DPW is still out there I think we only have half dozen eight roads left um, we're down to five mm -hmm. um, and they're coordinating with BG 120 roads um, you know half dozen to eight state highways um, that people had to be diverted uh, so, I mean, it's funny you say that. So Mrs. DeWeese got stuck on Bixler Church Road. Yep. <laughs> she, left, she left the courthouse at 430, yeah. and she got stuck between two locations. Trees had gone down behind her mm -hmm. and in front of her. And there was a new house on Bixler Church, and I, 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 I should get their names. I, I just texted her to ask them. But there was a, a couple that are uh, Howard County school teachers that uh, just built a house on Bixler Church that saw my wife sitting on the road stuck, and the the gentleman literally came out and waved her down the driveway because he knew something was wrong and they brought her into the house for a couple of hours didn't know anybody from adam they had just moved up here and wanted to make and they quickly became a part of the family because they they protected her Absolutely. and they went into the basement and, and that's what it is it's community we were able to rescue her later i thought about letting her stay there for a while but i <laughs> i, I, but, but, I uh, went out and got her so but that family that's there if they're good enough maybe they want to be carroll county yeah. uh public school well, teachers yeah, and you know yeah. we'll maybe work on that as well <laughs> but, but god um, bless them that's what you expect when you when you ride around this county that's it's, uh, so. you know and um commissioner gordon and i met with you uh that night um <clears throat> With the expectation that the governor and the administration was going to be out there we did the tour site he um like you said was diverted came out the next morning and i wasn't sure what to expect except that he was going to be coming out and want to see the site and commissioner kyler Gordon and i were out there you know obviously with you and all others but it wasn't just him it was the governor the lieutenant governor uh the secretary uh Wiedefeld, M. Dot. Um, the head of emergency management services was also out there. The superintendent of the state police who lives in Southern Maryland was there Colonel as well. The colonel was there. Um, it was, and it wasn't a dog and pony show. It wasn't photo you know, opportunities. Um, it was the ability to bring resources. There may have been a dog, but no pony, but, but, <laughs> yeah. but, but I agree. Yeah. But, but it, was, it was the ability to bring resources um, to the site. And, you know, uh, we, we and, and also the CEO of BG&E. Mm -hmm. There was 88,000 power outages in the state. 56,000 of them were in Carroll County. I think we're down to close now to five, 6,000. Um, and you're right, the North is gonna be the last. Um, it's like that last tactical mile. But 
56,000. There was 120 roads, as I mentioned. There was 400 plus um, 911 calls in an hour. Mm -hmm. Typically, there's what, 15 or 20 mm -hmm. at most? 400 plus. So every chair was occupied uh, under Valerie Hawkins' uh, you know, leadership. And, as and if you listen to them on the radio, you guys were in the car with me yeah. for a while. If you listen to those folks on the radio, I, I don't know how they stay as calm as they do, but, but there's got to be 8,000 things going on at one yeah. time. But, but we, we um, you, you talk about the calmness. We, they understand what we're seeing, and their voice somewhat calms us down. And, yeah. and so, so we rely on, on a calm voice on the other end when we're, we're yelling on the radio that, that they stay calm. And so they're remarkable. They are. And uh, Commissioner Gary and Sherrod, it was 200, a little over 200 were fire EMS uh, calls out of that 400 plus. I mean, it's just the, the magnitude of this. And, <clears throat> you know, so it was a county issue. It's a state issue. And um, we uh, that evening was asked to uh, speak to Fox and just to put things in perspective so i said okay we'll speak to fox and um fox news they asked us questions we prepared the uh questions and answers and then as we're preparing we're doing a sound check and the gentleman uh doing the sound check goes oh my gosh this is you know crazy you know where is this what do you mean where is this it's westminster maryland this was fox national it oh. was fox weather and um, I had no clue. I mean, we, we really, none of us in the room had any clue this was Fox National. And it's been replayed on Fox Weather National. Um, and really, what, uh, like the governor shared, what we did is um, what all communities should be doing in a crisis like this. Um, and uh, it was a testament. And I think he's going to be sharing that to a lot of folks but that's what you know this was all about um and the last thing i, I want to share <clears throat> is as most of you know i'm not the biggest fan of social media and uh as social media can twist things and editorialize things and make them sound like they're facts social media was absolutely used in the best manner during this crisis there was hundreds of shares on road closures there was stay off of this road go to this road i was sharing i shared actually a site that i typically wouldn't be sharing because it was the information that was necessary to get out to the community um I ask that social media continue to do that as we're going through the recovery phase of all of this. But uh, there is a, uh, a good use of um, social media, and I really do praise those that worked hard in getting uh, the messages out. You, you were going to say something? Yeah, just um, I, I appreciate the support, but, but uh, the, the deputies that work for me, yeah. um, the commanders, all of my commanders were out. Um, I didn't hear a peep from the jail. But, but they all made their way in and continued to do their jobs. And typically, if you don't hear a peep out of the jail, that's a good thing. Um, so uh, just overall, uh, I praise yeah. my staff and the folks that are, that are out there doing it. So I, I, I appreciate it. Absolutely. Uh, taking a lot of time talking about this, but I think it was uh, quality time worth and, and, and one more thing um, one of the things I shared with state level people and other people that asked me um, this is Carroll County and this is how people work together every day in some counties people would have been who are you or whatever we all work together without an emergency mm -hmm. and that makes it so smooth when it is one it's it's amazing and uh, you know, I, I, this I think I commented out. on the thread that, that people that my, my buddies that were right. commanders with state police asked me if I'm are you guys like do you guys hang out all the time because of how well we communicate and get along and they they thought that we had all gone to school. Not you, Kenny, but <laughs> they thought that maybe Ed and Tom and I'd gone to school yeah. at some point with yeah. each other. But just the way that we communicate with each other and the the nonverbal stuff that they mm -hmm. they pick up on and and i'm like now nah, this is we just are this out is so 
They think I went with your grandfather. Right, right. <laughs> Wait, where does that put me? My in older the, brother. Where does that put me in the list? <laughs> Middle school, I think, Joe. I'm not sure when, yeah, when I was in high there. school. <laughs> but, uh, okay, let's. Um, I think I'm first on the agenda anyway. Uh, not so. quite yet. We no. got a couple of. Oh, uh, I'll get out of here then. Yeah. So, okay. I, as yeah. I like to say, go away, but now, yeah. <laughs> but stay close. What I'd like to do is uh, recognize Maria. Come on up, and uh, why don't you all sit at the table? It's an opportunity uh, to recognize in the recognition of 15 years of distinguished service to Carroll County government, you exemplify the highest standard of performance and commitment in executing the vast responsibilities in your role in recycle, recycling manager since uh, August of 2008. As a recycling manager, your leadership and dedicated positive impact on Carroll County and our programs is evident in many areas, including through growing programs available to the public, or excuse me, growing programs, I am going to do this without my glasses, uh, available to the public and leading education and outreach to residents and businesses. Carroll County's recycling rate increased from 32% in 2008 to 42% in two, uh, 2021, increasing recycling program tons, tons managed from 178,000 in 2008 to over 375,000 in 2021, 110% increase um, through the public education. Help reduce contamination in residential recyclables from 22% to 10%, saving the county over $90,000 per year. That's important to me and my colleagues. We like to see savings as opposed to expenditures. Four year dedication to Carroll County and five boards of Carroll County Commissioners, this being the most favorite of yours, I'm sure, <laughs> um, who wholeheartedly thank you and wish you the very best for your future. You know, you've, uh, you, you've done a lot. Um, you've come in front of us <clears throat> um, with your education on um, opportunities. Uh, like I said, the outreach, you know, has been um, second to none. So truly, truly appreciate uh, the work you have done and all uh, opportunities that head your way in your future endeavors. Um, gentlemen, did you want to speak first and uh, let us or anybody want to say something uh, at this time? Yeah, Cliff and I both have something to, to say. I'm sure you do. <laughs> <laughs> that was good, bad, or indifferent. <laughs> uh, good morning, commissioners, and, and thank you very much. Uh, and uh, on behalf of Marie, and I'm sure she'll uh, say the same. Uh, Fifteen years ago, uh, back in 2008, we had a, a pretty much a fledgling recycling program. And due to some retirements, we had to go looking for a new recycling manager. Uh, so who could take all that foundation that was built before, you know, strengthen it, and grow it significantly, especially with all the changes that have been coming down uh, from the state over the years. Among the applicants for that position uh, was Maria, and her, who had just retired after 30 years with Giant Foods, heading up their recycling and waste programs regionally. So she was dealing with a lot of the same players, regulators, businesses, came into that interview with, with a ton of experience and a ton of knowledge, but most of all, a positive can-do attitude and a passion for the recycling industry. So again, you mentioned about the positive impacts that she's had you know, since 2008. I'm not going to reiterate those. Uh, but again, we are looked at now, Carroll County, as you know, one of the top tier recycling programs in the state. And that is in no small part due to Maria's efforts. Uh, a lot of that was behind the scenes. Uh, a lot of that was in times, you know, tough financial times when we were asked, you know, cut budgets, cut budgets. Maria found a way to do a lot of and find a lot of no cost and, and low cost recycling programs. And that's why we've had you know, that program improvement over those 15 years. Um, back in 2008, and I've got to be careful with this because Maria and I are also you know, friends other than coworkers. <laughs> um, back in 2008, I had the, actually had the pleasure of hiring her in my first time here through the county. And, and now I've got the bittersweet honor uh, of you know, kicking her to the curb as, <laughs> as the recycling man as she retires out the door and you know on, the, from, on behalf of all of us from DPW but also me personally thank you thank you yes sir 
It, it's been an absolute pleasure to work with Maria over the years. Um, Maria has such an incredible knowledge, understanding, and instinct when it comes to the recycling industry and the recycling markets. Uh, my favorite saying of Maria's is, we can do anything, but what are we willing to spend? And that's to say, ju just about anything can be recycled, but at what cost to the citizens of Carroll County? She has kept me from being overzealous and kept me grounded over the years when it comes to the seemingly endless uh, initiatives that can be undertaken in the recycling world. The county has been in great hands with Maria at the home. And Maria, thank you for all of you done, all you've done for Carroll County. Uh, you'll be greatly missed. And uh, the county is well positioned into the future thanks to your hard work and dedication to your position. Now, didn't you say a few years ago when Maria retired, you were going to cut the ponytail? I <laughs> <laughs> Maria, what's on your mind? Well, I just want to thank you. It's, I've always been thankful for having this position and to be here. Uh, yeah. We've had some ups and downs. Mm -hmm. I've had seven bureau chiefs in 15 years. <laughs> I've had twice. these twice. <laughs> well, you, you fixed them once. You had to go through I twice. was glad they came back. <laughs> you know? But uh, it's always been an honor to be here and uh, be part of this community. So, uh, yeah, we've had challenges, but we've persevered. And yeah. I thank you all for doing this. Absolutely. Thank you. Any, yeah, I, uh, I, I want to yeah. I want to say congratulations, and you will be missed. We actually did get a chance to spend a little bit of time yeah. together, and you're extremely enthusiastic about the program and all its initiatives. And you kind of schooled me a little bit on recycling, coming in as a bit of a skeptic, and then I left being somebody who was a proponent of it because there is a monetary piece to this. I mean, we do save ourselves some money in terms of how the landfill is operating when we when we sort and recycle. So, again. Uh, Congratulations, Maria, and really appreciate the opportunity to get to know you and everything you accomplished while you were here. So, appreciate thank it. Thank you. Gentlemen? Just want to say thank you. Obviously, you've, you've left a, a mark that someone's going to have to pick up and run with now, so we'll have to find someone capable. But uh, absolutely thank you for all your hard work and dedication. It's uh, very appreciated by all of us and definitely all the uh, folks in the community as well. Thank, thank you. you. And, and again, thank you, and you know better than we do, but recycling is such a popular term, mm -hmm. it is not easy. And like many things, it keeps getting more and more complicated. So thank you for making it look easy from the outside. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Joe, what four or five syllable words you have to share? <laughs> You mean what four or five multisyllabic words I have? <laughs> well, first of all, congratulations, and then thank you very much for the time that you've spent with the county. Uh, you know, like Commissioner Guerin, I, uh, I've had certain skepticisms about recycling in the past because I wasn't quite sure about its cost effectiveness or how effective it actually was just as a process in and of itself. But, but you know, through your tenure and then over the, the past couple of years, having come from the municipal, municipal side of things, as we've... Uh, as the municipalities have also engaged in the recycling program. Uh, you know, I've learned a lot, and I, like Commissioner Guerin, I'm a proponent of it as well. And uh, I could not imagine having learned what I did or come to appreciate the way that I did had you not been in the position that you are. So thank you very much for that, and God bless you in all of your future endeavors. Thank you. So what's on your mind? No. <laughs> Just moving forward, I'm gonna, uh, my husband's been retired for five years. I'm okay. going to probably take some of his space up. So, uh, <laughs> Deservingly. Yeah, and I'm uh, just going to uh, move forward and just see what else is new out there and relax a little bit now. Yeah. But I'll keep an eye on you folks. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a plan. Let's get a, uh, a photo, a little memento, and okay. get you on your way. Okay. Thank you.
Okay, uh, let's talk about the media center. Yes. Uh, we got folks from it. Okay, excellent. So the uh, I got the honor of reading a certificate of recognition for the community media center. But I, I just wanted to mention the community media center has a an interesting distinction because you every single person running for county office comes through your <laughs> center so you get a good look at us before anybody else and uh, my experience with you last summer summer before last not this one a year ago was you've got amazing staff it was my first time ever going through that process and i think a lot of us are in the same boat and we didn't i didn't make too much of a fool of myself in front of your staff and we had plenty of outtakes and things we redid over but i just think it's an interesting distinction that your center is very much involved and and how this county is operating in terms of the election. So I've got the Thank honor you. of reading this certificate of recognition. This certificate is awarded to the Community Media Center. This certificate is presented to the Community Media Center, otherwise known as CMC, in recognition of their national award from the Alliance for Community Media. The Community Media Center received a hometown media award in the virtual event category for their production of the 33rd annual Outstanding Teachers Awards. Community Media Center's innovations, innovative use of digital technologies helps to inform, engage, and connect our communities every day, and we are honored to recognize your center. So congratulations, sir. Thank you. Oh, okay, thanks. Gifts? Yeah, yeah, just so. Okay. I just want to add that this was a collaboration while the Community Media Center is named specifically. Um, you know, the, uh, this is a recognition of a partnership. Unfortunately, Mike McMullen had to leave before uh, we got to this point in the agenda. Uh, but uh, the chamber is the key component here that brought together the partnership between the schools and that's why Se Se uh, Superintendent McCabe is here as well uh, because the award recognizes the Community Media Center, it's the uh, 2022 Outstanding Teacher Awards Virtual Events Access Center Professional and it's the Community Media Center of Carroll County, Carroll County Chamber of Commerce and Carroll County Public Schools. Um, this was a highly competitive uh, award. Uh, the nominees were from across the country at a time under which virtual events during the pandemic were significant. And uh, I am so honored to have uh, been recognized by our peers, but more importantly, I think it's a recognition, as you have mentioned previously, of the partnerships that do exist in Carroll County and how important it is to get the word out about what happens in Carroll County. And we did that as, uh, as it was great to be able to be in Brooklyn when we received the actual award. And you'll get a little bit of a clip if you go to that uh, uh, that video clip that's on the handout that just went there. Okay. So, uh, S Superintendent McCabe, if you want, I don't know if you want to add anything in terms of the uh, the honor and the distinction. I'll just say uh, that I just want to thank uh, the chamber and the CMC for offering uh, offering this opportunity to us during um, during the pandemic. You know, it was a very rough time. Uh, for Carroll County Public Schools and for all public schools during the pandemic. And um, I think it, it, was, it was something that we could do to um, increase morale of our staff during a very, very difficult time. Mm -hmm. And so it was definitely much needed and much appreciated. So thank you. Absolutely. Any thoughts from up here? And just congratulations on the award, but also on the services that you provide to the community. I know Commissioner Garen had talked about how, uh, you know, going through the elections, all of us come through the media center, but so do municipal elected officials. So do, so do sports activities and other events and and, and festivities and fairs throughout the course of the uh, throughout the course of the year. You, know, you really are uh, an integral part of this community, and I really do thank you for what you do and for being a part of that, being willing to be a part of the community. So God bless you, and thank you for that. And I'll just uh, <clears throat> I'll just echo that, and obviously congratulations. I did mention that I think it was last Thursday, which might have been a month ago now. I'm not sure, but um, uh, besides obviously interacting with elections and so forth, you you know, and the various other events, be it the uh, the chamber sports and so forth, you also have a good educational component. Uh, I know personally 
some, I don't know, maybe five years ago, I was in with uh, Boys and Girls Club when they were there to learn about what you do and get to play with the green screens. And, and, I, and I think it's just, it's, it's noteworthy to mention that not only do you do a lot production-wise and service-wise in the community, but there's a huge education component. And I think given all the rich history and stories in Carroll County, it's always appreciated how you find a way to pull all that together and save that for not only but for us, but for future generations like you do. I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I like the innovation. I like the uh, continued growth and the what if ideas, you know? Um, I mean, honestly, that's I think how you started the, uh, the sports piece of this. It's like, what if? You know, people want to see this, you know, and, you know, they can't get to some place, so they have it available, and then they know it's being televised. They get to, you know, uh, record it and have it in perpetuity or for however long uh, they'd like, and um, that's fun, you know, to kind of just continue to say the, the what if and can we do this? Do we have the resources? Um, you know, what does the community want? That's you know pretty cool and you've been the leading edge of that you know listening learning and leading uh the um the cmc you know for the community support so that's my thoughts thank you and, thank you. and congratulations on an awesome national award but again i think uh one of the reasons something like this happens is how your entities work together on you know all year not just for this but thank you for doing this Thank you. Yeah, a number of the events that were mentioned this morning are ones that we've been involved with uh, and want to cover. We take uh, the community part of our name very seriously yes. uh, and want to make sure that it's reflected in the uh, sometimes news desert or media desert or distortions that happen in social media uh, that we can get the accurate word out um, through good representation of what goes on in our community. Um, I just want to add a, a little personal note. I know the events of Monday uh, certainly dwarf, feels like it dwarfs this recognition to a degree of the outstanding efforts that occurred. I happened to be in the first queue on the left-hand turn on 140 onto Malcolm when the polls came down. Mm. And I wanted to add the um, calm voice in the end of 911 when we called uh, and the emergency operators that I can imagine that they had to deal with uh, as well. Um, and so I thank all the county for their services, uh, including maintaining our emergency services so that our communications could continue uh, during the power outage. Um, so. No, thank you for that personal testament, and that's going to be shared, so important. Okay, why don't we uh, get a still photo of this <laughs> and, uh, for a memento. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. So in the next 15 minutes, we're going to go through 15 <laughs> items. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. Where is Chris? Good morning, commissioners. Chris, do you think you could pull the PowerPoint up for me? PowerPoint? Yes. <laughs> It's pretty basic if Tim did it. <laughs> In the meantime, uh, this was an initiative of Commissioner Gordon. Uh, after conversations with uh, the sheriff and state's attorney's office, it became apparent that uh, there are a couple of 
institutions in the county and a couple of residences maybe where uh, that are constantly calling for law enforcement assistance to uh, uh, situations um, involving nuisance activity and that involves dispatching a police officer to the uh, institution or the residence uh, making reports doing some investigations and constituting a, a drain on the police re resources all at the expense of uh, two or three four or five properties in the county uh, next slide please is that uh, red phone the Kremlin hotline <laughs> What is that, Tim? That's, that's Tim's actual phone. In his <laughs> I asked my staff to. Uh, high it's a bat phone at Wayne Man. <laughs> <laughs> so what are we what are we looking for? Uh, looking at uh, the number of the calls uh, is pretty remarkable, and, and I, you, you uh, gentlemen, can chime in whatever you like. Um, for example, in the Eldersburg area, uh, Eldersburg Police District, you have two stores. Uh, which generated 54% of the police calls uh, mm -hmm. within, a, a, within a calendar year. That's two, two establishments. And uh, next slide. What results uh, in these calls? I'm sorry. But what is that picture? I can't see. It's a line of police cars. Um, okay. Presumably that's Our you vehicles. in the front. What was <laughs> your vehicle? And what? we're all following you, so. Um. <laughs> That's how slowly you drive, yeah, Tim. Yeah. It looks like a funeral procession. He's in that area. So, what are we hoping to accomplish here? No, I'm good, thank you. Yes. Here's your glass. What are we hoping to accomplish here? Several counties, several municipalities, several um, boroughs, duchies all throughout the country have adopted uh, ordinances which penalize establishments certain establishments or certain residences for excessive use of police calls. Um, keep going, one more slide. This picture, for example, was taken at Chris Swam's apartment by the sheriff last night. <laughs> <laughs> what sort of activity are we trying to, uh, uh, what sort of activity results in one of these police calls? Well, it, it's uh, usually theft, um, prostitution, drug use, noise, drug activity, uh, public disorder, other kinds of bad behavior. And, and this is the sort of nuisance activity that results in these calls to the um, property owner. Next slide, please. So what are we hoping to accomplish here? And this is where you, you gentlemen can chime in. We're trying to get businesses to, to clean up their act, if you will, and, and adopt some reasonable security measures uh, to prevent this nuisance activity occurring on their premises. Because as it stands now, um, it appears we're just serving as almost like a security service for, for a couple of establishments at, at the taxpayer's expense. And I would add that these uh, nuisance activities are rarely prosecuted. Uh, the, the property owners rarely press charges on these. So it really involves just a visit by the, by the law enforcement officers and, and uh, a report is made, used by the property owner for whatever purpose, and it ends right there. Is that correct? That the, that, uh, that's pretty much yeah. pretty much correct yes so without prosecutions these these things are going to continue and can continue and continue and without security uh, the calls are going to continue and we wanted to give the property owners an incentive to as I said clean up their act talk to the d deputies uh, and impose some some reasonable security measures to prevent these nuisance activities and present the the, the calls in the first place anybody want to add anything on that I mean, commissioners, we've worked with um, businesses and residents, landowners, throughout the the, uh, the course of, of several years to try and abate repeat calls for service. Some have been successful, others have been to no end. So this ordinance will give us um, a judicial uh, authority to go ahead and hold those who don't wish to work with us accountable um, in a manner that uh, kind of supersedes what we're doing right now. So, so how's the process going to work? It's, it's going to be a graduated approach, and we're going to start with a warning. Uh, if your property is a um, non-residential, that is a uh, commercial institution, uh, mixed use, you get five uh, five calls, and the sh sheriff's deputy is going to warn you that you're approaching 
uh, probationary status. So with residential and multifamily, residential you get three calls, and multifamily you get six calls. And as, as I said, this is a warning. They're, they're going to warn you that you're halfway there to getting put on probationary status, which is where the, the rubber meets the road. Uh, the next slide, please. Now, once uh, one of the properties hits the actual uh, target date for probation, you're put on probation, probationary status. And what that means is for a non-resident or uh, mixed use, you get 10 calls, <clears throat> residential use, five calls, and a multifamily use, 12 calls. And all of these are within the, the calendar year. Once you hit that number, anything above that, uh, there's going to be some penalties. And uh, any comments on that? Okay. Next slide, please. The penalties are going to be, uh, keep one more slide, please. The penalties that are going to be imposed are um, fines, civil citations issued by the sheriff's deputy. And the first fine for uh, exceeding your probationary status is $500. Second will be $750 and the third offense would be a thousand dollar citation and those can be appealed to the to the district court of maryland uh, so there's going to be some mandatory exemptions under our ordinance in other words that won't count towards the probation uh, crimes which are in progress that affect the public <coughs> safety in other words if they get a call help we got a, a theft in progress here that's not going to count uh, mental health uh, medical emergencies that would be overdoses that sort of thing domestic violence cases uh, trespass violations and any calls mandated but mandated by the federal or state law those would be exempt from uh, uh, the ordinance they wouldn't count towards the calls towards probationary status does that make sense uh, any questions of the of our guests or <laughs> so real quick the, the there's a spirit of the law and the letter of the law right and and so our goal is to have establishments or residences or complexes work with us on security and making sure that um, we are not constantly responding to these establishments and they're indifferent to the fact that we're responding and they just simply don't care. And I've been hard over the years on Walmart and everybody knows it and I'm very public about it. Mm -hmm. But I will tell you that the Walmart in Eldersburg, the responses that we have there are because they are being proactive for the most part. They're calling us because their loss prevention has apprehended someone. And that, that is, that's good with me. That means they're being proactive then. Um, but there are establishments that simply don't care like Tim said that just simply want us to take a report so when tax time hits they can say that they're being proactive and trying to stop theft and write it off um, that that's kind of what we're looking for we want to we understand the letter of the law but the spirit of the law says work with us and we'll work with you and as long as that takes place then 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 we'll be fine um, and we threw in the exemptions that you that you saw because we want people that are in um, particular situations that it may take four or five calls to us in a short period of time to get something done, um, whether it's a domestic violence complaint or, or a mental health or overdoses. There's, there's residences we go to or um, houses that have multiple res, you know, residents there that are in, in treatment that may have uh, multiple calls to that establishment, but we understand that. And commissioners, I know you have the ordinance in front of you and you'll see as you read through it that it, it really does give our office the autonomy to make the decisions as to whether or not somebody's in violation. Um, we change a lot of shells to maze. And so you'll see that throughout um, the ordinance, which is a good change uh, to give us the authority as uh, the public safety entity, uh, the law enforcement entity of the county, to have the autonomy to um, determine whether or not somebody is willing to work with us or is just calling us because they want us to come down and take a report. And and I guess we're next headed to a public hearing, and but I think the public needs to hear then and now. This is an ordinance to hopefully change behavior, not to raise money, not to go out and, and serve citations. It's to change behavior, and the hopeful would be it's going to minimize the problems. Commissioner Kyler, in places that have enacted these types of ordinance, 
uh, there's a, sometimes there's not a lot of enforcement. Sometimes the just publicizing that it's coming, getting out there and educating merchants and, and others is enough. So it's, I've got the stick, don't make me use the stick. And in a lot of jurisdictions, we haven't seen a lot of action on this. But once again, they've gotten good response, particularly like your Walmarts, but your mom and pop, you go out and tell them, you're going to work with a, a local business and they're going to respond. So, And, and this is a, a potential tool that you don't have anything similar to now. You don't have anything else that would address this problem. This is a tool you need. Correct, yes. There's no, there's nothing like this in any of the municipalities now. There are nuisance, but they're back end loaded, and it's very cumbersome to enter into consent agreements and the like, and what you can do. Um, and there is a real stick here, not just because, well, a thousand bucks, nothing to Walmart. Maybe they pay it, but if you don't pay it, it becomes a lien on the property. And I suppose the people that they're leasing space from would not be too happy with that. Might have a word. So there is a way, you know, uh, to do this. So, like I said. Um, at the very least, it highlights the problem, and you'll have these interactions. So, and Major Stem's 100% right. I mean, he's probably the best lawyer in the room, um, no offense, <laughs> but he hasn't gone to law school. And it, this does give a discretion. So this doesn't handcuff the sheriff in any way. It just gives him discretion to do what he needs. Another, another tool in the toolbox. That's it. So... Um yeah, so today it's either we move forward or not move forward as uh, regarding the public hearing. Um, it makes sense that we're going to be moving forward. The concern I have is do we need another tool in the toolbox? I mean, how many more tools do we need? Do we have the resources available to um, use that tool? You know, that's... You know, that's something we discussed. And any time I concerned. bring something online, whether it's school bus cameras, right. um, those sort of things, it, it requires um, resources. It does to, to keep track of this. Uh, we we know um, at my level and all the way down to the to the road deputies what what locations are are causing us the most issue. Right. And, and if there's a an outlier that shows up and, <clears throat> and and then we concentrate on that one um so i i don't think that the resources are going to be like it would would be with bus patrol with the amount of time we've got to take to do that it's really um it's really understanding the community and what locations are 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 the problem and if one pops up then we we address it and, and then educating our deputies on how how to get that that word to folks and and uh and research it appropriately. I, I just I don't think it's going to be a burden on us. Um, I just don't think it is. And there are mechanisms. There's criminal law that addresses houses mm -hmm. when it comes to drug activity and prostitution, Mike. I, Correct. I think. So, so there's there's that in the toolbox, and and we have addressed that, and and we do it we do it with our drug units and and right. asset forfeiture. Um, but this this whole uh, whether it's a Walmart or it's an establishment like that, a business or or mom and pop, um, we've never had the ability to to have some sanctions on folks like that 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 are indifferent to the fact that they've got a lot of problems. They just don't want to recognize it yeah. and almost are in, in inviting the problems by not recognizing it. So, no, I, I I appreciate. I mean, for me, I just don't want to one person position where. We are over governing, mm -hmm. you know, the community, and then also at the same time, I want to make sure we're putting us ourselves in a position that whatever ordinances we are putting in place, that we have the resources uh, to enforce, or you know, kind of put the ground game in place. And and you're right, um, like down in Ellersburg, those deputies they know the hot spots, they know, you know locations same thing up in Westminster and all the others and I would and we direct them to keep an eye on those hot spots yeah. I mean it's not like we just okay. wait for it to happen we're very okay. proactive about that and um, I, I don't see it as a okay. an ordinance that that uh, we would prefer people just work with us and and again and yeah. Walmart's a good example they do work yeah. with us 
but a lot of that's predicated on who's managing that store at that particular time. And if they rotate out and it's someone that doesn't want to be proactive with right. with theft, then then there's an issue. And then we've got to step in. And I don't know how many times we've been to uh, to the institutions, the establishments that Tim talks about. I don't know how many times we've been to them saying, get yeah. better, get better. And here's how we can help you. It's not just get better, but these are the resources we're willing to put into, into helping you, but you've got to help yourself as well. Last, um, I guess, uh, question for me, I believe last, is the municipalities are in agreement with this and you know, the relationship you have with the municipalities is second to none. Um, I mean, is this something that they would be, you know? I think they would love for me to be able yeah. to come in and, and hold yeah. an establishment accountable if they don't have an ordinance locally yeah. that they can do the same. Yep. So, yeah. yeah. yeah okay. They're always free to adopt their own ordinance if they want to. And if they I think some of them have it, so. Right. If they, want to, if they want to opt out, they can adopt, a, you know, a similar almost identical ordinance and have their own police do it. But I don't think they would. I think this is... They would prefer you know, me to come in. Yeah. And, sure. Yeah, there's... Okay. Okay. So, look, I'm totally in favor of this. I'm in favor of moving it forward to public hearing as well. I think it has to do with responsible participation in a community, whether you're a resident or whether you are a business. Um, the only question, uh, or I guess further clarification, I know I brought up with you gentlemen at National Night Out, uh, under on page 5 under section H number 10, the response had nothing to do with the property in question other than being on the street in the area of the property. And I was a little confused with the wording of that, and I was wondering if we might you did that on purpose, Joe. I mean, if you're confused about wording, then, then <laughs> we're, we're well, in I, trouble. I, as I, so as I, as well, I said, Commissioner, yeah. like I said, this is one of those, I'll give you an example. Like you're in front of an establishment and you get pickpocketed and you make the call, and has nothing, you just happen to be on the street in front of the establishment it's not fair to charge because it had no nexus to the establishment yeah. Yeah. right so that as if if the person who pickpocketed was staying in a boarding house and they had these kind of like rent by the hour maybe be their nexus to the establishment gotcha okay. another so, good example commissioner would be that the, the, he talks about the boarding house or or the establishment you're parked there and somebody comes along and starts tugging on doors and they steal out of a out of cars that are sitting at at your establishment um it had nothing to do with the fact that uh, of the establishment it, it just happened to be on that property where it took place and that's just a discretionary thing that we would look at um, when we start looking at these calls and, and it wouldn't so be a blanket thing where we go to our CAD system and go oh you were, we were here five times this month let's go out and start right right and that's not what this is about and by I, no means right and that that was not the uh, I promise that was not the intent of the the question I just wanted to see if we could find a way maybe to clarify that language a little bit because if I'm you know, if I'm a common citizen or a common business owner and I'm looking at that and I'm a little confused by it, I mean, would it be possible instead of saying it the way that it is, do we say the response had nothing to do with the property in question other than the response being on the street in the area of the property? Is that, is that too much or is that, is that legally acceptable? Yes, we can do that. Okay. Everybody okay with adding that? You can direct him to do that. <laughs> well, I, I want to I wanna thank Mr. Stewart and Major Stem and... Sheriff Deweese, I'm sure you had something to do with this as well. I didn't actually. <laughs> telling us that we're going to do it. Listen, yeah, no. it, there's no doubt he is the smartest yeah. guy I've ever worked with. But yeah. but Mike's right; he's the smartest uh, attorney that's not an attorney. So um, um, see lawyers. Yeah, uh, there, there smart was guy. an assumption that you had something to do with yeah. this. Very little. Oh, yeah, my name will be somewhere. Um, <laughs> yeah. But uh, no, I want to thank you both for this, and I want to thank Commissioner Gordon for this as well. I think this is a great idea. You know, what's interesting is every Thursday we we talk about what a great county we live in. And it is a great county, but it won't stay that way unless we're willing to make proactive measures, take proactive measures. And sometimes that involves thinking outside the box just a little bit. And I think that's what this is here. So, um, again, I'm just extremely appreciative of it and um, looking forward to moving it to uh, a public hearing. Okay. Is there a motion somewhere? Motion to proceed to a public hearing. Second. I got a motion, got a second, and just please. Um, providing we pass this motion, what's the process moving forward? We will uh, run an advertisement twice in the Carroll County Times and invite uh, public comment at, a, at the public hearing or uh, through emails or, or, or correspondence with the county commissioners. So everybody will get a chance to be heard, including the property owners. Uh, and then how do we react to the public hearing? <laughs> you sit. 
quietly. <laughs> oh, no, afterwards. In other words, can this be tweaked as a result oh, of the public yeah. hearing? And yes, if you uh, have to wait yes. 30 days, two weeks, or what after yes, the public hearing? Yes, if Commissioner hearing. Vigliotti re reads it again and says, I don't like 10D, <laughs> we can always tweak that. But the public is on notice that uh, will be on notice that you're considering adopting a, a nuisance call ordinance. So that will that will trigger their interest if if they're so inclined. Will you uh, will you call to advertise with that red phone? <laughs> and, and, uh, I'm is, going back to the TED slides from now on. Black and white, no pictures. <laughs> and if, if the public hearing goes well and we tweak it, whatever, what's what's the soonest that this could be effective? I, within 45 days, I would say. Yeah. Okay. I think you guys should probably make an effective date, I presume. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay, so I have a motion. I mean, 45 days from today, you yeah, gotcha. You're in yep. place. Yep. That's what I, mean. I, I will say just one very quick thing about that red phone, since somebody brought it up, is I did have a red phone in my quarters on the <laughs> installation, and Sam would pick it up, mm -hmm. and it was a direct line to the, my police. So my police would come right to the quarters, <laughs> like, okay, we don't touch this phone anymore. So, yeah. I have one on my bus, um, the command bus, and when I pick it up, the cord clips. So I'm not sure what, <laughs> what it can. I think we just have to have a red phone on it for... Did, hmm. did your phone have a rotary dial? <laughs> that phone didn't. That phone, it was just, you pick up, and it was right to uh, the police. Okay, enough of this. Uh, any more discussion on this? Seen here, none all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank, you, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Okay, let's talk about the contract renewal, support and management of the computer-aided dispatch. <clears throat> Are you both coming up or just one? <laughs> Come on up. And um, as you sit down, uh, Chris, do you by chance have that photo? Yeah. Mr. Swam? Chris, are you there? <laughs> okay. That's the photo I want to share. There's the star right there. And <laughs> it was just a great opportunity, one, for the governor to share to the entire community by name, uh, both Roberta and Valerie, and, um, and highlight the work that they have done. Uh, and uh, we could not have gone out of such a catastrophic situation and a, in dire uh, need of so much support if it wasn't for Valerie, your entire team. And all I am hearing uh, is like uh, it was just said earlier, the uh, from Mr. Turner because he called 911 was the calmness from your 911 operators and both of you the work you've done uh, is just you know second to none and um, we're going to move forward with the governor like I shared on resources and he wants me to talk more about 911 um, you know services and resources that are needed but I just wanted to throw that out there just a very strong appreciation for you your leadership and uh, the entire team um, that you had uh, during this very difficult time so thank you so much thank you commissioner um, we definitely have a good team Jack's folks worked very very hard uh, emergency management was uh, in the EOC until about midnight on Monday and then activated all day on Tuesday um, so we, they answered a lot of calls. They, uh, every, every seat that we had possibly available in the 911 center at New Windsor was, was filled. Yeah. Um, so yep. they, they Jack, do a very difficult you. job, so, but it's definitely I, a team sport. I also want to point out very quickly, something Commissioner Guerin had mentioned <coughs> earlier, that the uh, Department of Fire and Emergency Services has been in effect for about two months. Yep. And, and Valerie, you have not been in this position for long. Mm -hmm. Right, and and so we, yeah, I think that's a testament to your abilities and your your professionalism. That you know, given such a short time in this specific role, we hit the ground running as well as we did. So thank you for that. Thank you. Now let's make sure that we can renew some of the equipment necessary for you to continue these operations. Right. We absolutely need our computer-rated dispatch system to be able to do everything that Jack and his folks did on Monday okay. and every other day. Yep. 
So what do you have to say? All right. Um, the Office of Procurement, in cooperation with the Department of Public Safety, requests your approval to award the renewal of, of support and maintenance of computer-aided dispatch, software interfaces, field mobile applications, and licenses to Keystone Public Safety, incorporated in the amount of $232,253. This amount is approved in the fiscal year 24 budget, and no additional funds should be required. Uh, Jack, any thoughts on this besides it just being necessary yeah, this this goes towards the computer aided dispatch system all the uh, records management systems the jails management systems the MDTs and all the uh, fire and law enforcement apparatus so it's just the annual maintenance agreement with the vendor this is integrated is it integrated also across the jurisdictions with the law enforcement agencies that, that we manage right. that we dispatch for so Westminster Police, Hampstead, Tony, or Hampstead, Manchester, Mount Airy. What if um, somebody from Baltimore County was coming in? Would you be able to? You mean like from mutual be able to talk aid? To them on the radio, mutual aid. They you'd, wouldn't have access to our MDTs or anything like right. that. But you'd be able to just to reach out to them via we radio. We still talk with them. Yeah. Yes. Okay. That's okay. on the Motorola side yeah. of the. Okay. Right. Okay. That's not through these systems Got specifically. It. Got it. Okay. Okay. Motion to approve the renewal for support and maintenance of computer aided dispatch and related services to Keystone Public Safety Incorporated in the amount of two hundred thirty two thousand two hundred fifty three dollars. Second. <coughs> second. We got a motion, you guys second any discussion on this one. Seeing here none all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you, Commissioners. All you're doing and please pass my regards to all and I'll try and get back over there as well. Uh, you're you know, certainly welcome dispatch. anytime you want to come out. Thank yep. you. Absolutely. Okay, let's talk about the Brightly Software Asset Essentials. Morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Morning. All right. Um, the Office of Procurement, in cooperation with the Department of Technology Services, requests your approval to award the support renewal of asset essentials to Brightly Software Incorporated in the annual amount of thirty-three thousand. $392.23. Brightly Software was awarded a competitively bid contract through Sourcewell uh, Cooperative Purchasing Consortium. This amount is approved in the fiscal year 24 <coughs> budget and no additional funds should be required. Okay. Commissioners, this Assets Essential is, is a work order system and asset management program for the Bureau of Facilities. Um, it processes all their work orders and it also helps them quite a bit with um, forecasting capital expenditures as we move through um, the years. And I have uh, Mr. Justin McConnell here with me if you have any questions about the use of the product. We've had it for about four years now. Um, Roberta, what's the price tag? Um, for procurement, is it twenty five thousand? Okay, mm -hmm. and may, we may we have still maintained it at twenty five thousand. We uh, submitted a request to the General Assembly to change that to fifty yeah. last year, thought. but it was submitted a little late, so it didn't okay. get through. So I believe the board will probably want to submit that again this yeah. year. And okay, we'll, that, that's we'll, what we'll honestly, that's that. what I, I thought that we submitted to fifty. So, okay, thanks. <clears throat> Motion to approve the renewal of support for asset essentials to Brightly Software Incorporated in the amount of $33,392.23. Second. A motion, I got a second. Uh, did you want to say something? I like the system. Works well with facilities. Keeps us on target. Keeps us on track. So thank you for the approval. Absolutely. Any other discussion? Seeing here none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Ripper, how is, how's the broadband study coming along? Going well. I don't know if you saw I, in the last commissioner's report that you got monthly, you saw I had a little report in there. We'll be updating that um, each month like you've asked for us to be able to do that. Okay. Um, the uh, two big things that you're going to see in the next report is that um, Sullivan Road construction has begun and is well underway and will probably be completed ahead of schedule. It's supposed to be finished by December of this year, but uh, it's moving along well. And we also, in, um, we're doing the Lineborough Harney construction has begun to get fiber up to there. And we did work with the town of Manchester to change the route a little bit to help them out so that their town hall and other residents would be able to um, attach into the fiber backbone. So, so that's the te technology services report that's, that, is that Yes, the broadband's under the technology services report. 
And uh, are we going to see Mr. Ripper at some point yep. here? Yes, and then we'll be up later after uh, Mako and everything will come okay, up before good. you okay. and uh, be able to put some maps up on the screen and show you some things Excellent. so people right, can really thank understand. You. Appreciate it. Thank you. Absolutely. Yep. Don't go far, Ryan. You know that. Uh, no, I'll, I'll be hanging out. Uh, you, just sit, <laughs> you just sit in the front row. Okay. Yeah. Carrie, Andy, come on up and let's talk about engineering services for the Longleaf Pine Road Water Main Project. Good, Good morning. 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 The Office of Procurement, in cooperation with the Bureau of Utilities, requests your approval to award a contract for engineering services for the design of the Longleaf Pine Road Water Main Project to Whitman Riker Associates in the amount of $40,722. Whitman Reichert and Associates is currently under a term contract with the county. This proposal amount is within the adopted budget and no additional funds will be necessary. Good morning, gentlemen, and as always, thank you for including me on your weekly schedule. Uh, some background information regarding this item. The Freedom Water Service area consists of the high elevation zone and the low elevation zone. These names are based on the overflow elevation of the water storage tanks in each zone and not the base water pressure. And I'll speak about these elevation zones in much more detail in, in the uh, following uh, item. F for this uh, conversation, however, please be aware that because of being located within the low elevation zone and close proximity to the March water storage tank, the 120 re residential properties in this immediate area, including those on Longleaf Pine Road, Pitch Pine Court, White Cedar Court, Pinion Pine Court, the names of these are amazing, and a section of Johnsville Road have water pressures that are on the low end of the acceptable range. So this project will result in a substantial increase in water pressure for these properties. Thanks to the insight of three members of my staff, including Larry Bloom, Mike Zeckman, and Sean Hartman, it has been found that it is possible to transition these properties to the high elevation zone with water main piping improvements and valving changes. So the, the, the uh, end result is it is anticipated that the system water pressure will increase from the 24 to 40 PSI range to 50 to 72 PSI. Wow. A, a dramatic increase. T to accomplish this, we need a, a 460 linear foot 8 inch water main uh, for, for the Longleaf Pine Road from Johnsville Road to the March water tank. Uh, this item is for the consulting work to, to prepare the construction drawings and specifications. Following this, the construction improvement project will be advertised for bid, and once constructed, the transition of the properties from the low zone to the high zone will be made by valving changes. And with your approval of this project, it is anticipated that the consultant work will be completed by March of 2024, and our goal beyond that is to have the construction work awarded and completed by the end of calendar year 2024. <laughs> Any questions from it? You're going to make people happy. Very much so. I mean, going from 40 PSI to 50, I mean, well, that's and my staff did a tremendous job on, on the background information of that. I, I'm, I'm a little, yeah. I'm pleasantly surprised that it can be done this way. That's fantastic. I, I truly appreciate you uh, recognizing your staff as well for the hard work that they're doing. Okay, are there any uh, questions? No, you can go. You sure? It's District I'm 5. Positive. Sure? All right. I'm positive. Motion to award a contract for engineering services for the design of the Longleaf Pine Road Water Main Project to Whitman, Reckart and Associates, LLP, in the amount of $40,722.00. Second. I got a motion. I got a second. Any discussion on this one? Seen here, none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Let's talk about the Liberty Wards Water Storage Tank. The Office of Procurement, in cooperation with the Bureau of Utilities, requests your approval to award a contract for engineering services for the design of the Liberty Water Storage Tank Booster Pump Station to Whitman, Reichert, and Associates in the amount of $186,749. Whitman, Reichert, and Associates is currently under a term contract with the county, and this proposal amount is within the adopted budget, and no additional funds will be necessary. So, gentlemen, for a brief background of, of the basis of this project, uh, uh, once again, the Freedom Water Service area is divided into, into two major zones, the low, the low elevation zone, which is about 80 percent of the service area and generally includes everything east of Maryland 32, and the high elevation zone, which is the remaining 20 percent, and is generally everything west of 32 and north of Sykesville. The, the low zone includes the Freedom Water Treatment Plant, the 1 million gallon uh, storage tank at, at, at Liberty, and the one million gallon storage tank at March Road. The high zone includes the 500,000 gallon Linton tank at Century High School. Uh, the, uh, the Linton tank is supplied by the booster pump station at the March tank, and there's currently no backup system in place for the March tank uh, booster pump station at this time. 
And as I said a few minutes earlier, the names of the zones are based upon the overflow elevations of the storage tanks and, and, and not the, the, uh, the, the base water pressures. So the, the low elevation zone, the tanks overflow at 737 feet of elevation, and the high zone overflows at 795 feet. So basically, in a, in a nutshell, what, um, what that means is the water, the, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, water treatment plant can't push water out into the high zone. The, the, the low zone water storage tanks would overflow before water would reach the high zone. So we need a booster pump station that, that sends the water from the low zone into the high zone. And, and, and the issue right now is not having a backup system in place for that water booster pump station. So uh, uh, we, we've had previous studies that were conducted for the Bureau, and they have recommended that a second booster pump station be installed for both redundancy and to help with an ongoing water stagnation issue within the Liberty Water Storage Tank. At this time, if the March booster pump station were to go offline for any reason, there are no direct internal means of, of providing water to the high zone. Third-party contractors and rental pumps w would be needed, and, and there would be a substantial time delay to supply water to the high elevation zone while this work is being coordinated. Secondly, and, and because of water service area operating parameters, it is challenging for, for my Bureau to consistently fully overturn the 1.0 million gallons of water stored in the Liberty Tank. And finally, the uh, Linton Tank was constructed in 1998, is beginning to show signs of wear and will need to be repainted in the upcoming years. In order to do so, the tank will, be, will need to be taken offline for four to six months. With the tank offline, we have limited confidence in the ability to, to supply water and pressure to the high zone exclusively via the March booster pump station, and little to no confidence in providing the unnecessary water volume and pressure needed for extended firefighting efforts. The, the, the construction of the Liberty booster pump station will resolve each of these concerns. So th this item is for engineering services for the, for the uh, Liberty Booster Pump Station and a 3,000-foot connection of a 12-inch diameter water main along Johnsville Road from the water tank to the high elevation zone. This, this facility is a much-needed proactive improvement to the overall Freedom Water Service System, and the scope of work includes the, the construction drawings and all county and MDE per permit-related services. This booster pump station will function as the primary water supply for the high elevation zone, and the March tank booster pump station will, will remain in rotation with Liberty to ensure that there are two fully functioning and redundant means of providing the high elevation zone with potable water. Furthermore, having the booster pump station um, uh, set up within the Liberty tank footprint will allow the station to draw water directly from the bottom of that tank itself, and this will greatly increase the turnover of the, of the stored water within the tank, and it, it will reduce the stagnant water concerns. And, and upon award of this contract, engineering services will be completed by the middle of 2024. Following that, the, the project will then be advertised for construction bids. Any questions for me? No. Motion to award a contract for engineering services for the design of the Liberty Water Storage Tank Booster Pump Station to Whitman Reichardt and Associates LLP in the amount of one hundred eighty-six thousand seven hundred forty-nine dollars and zero cents. Second. Okay, I got a motion. I got a second. Any discussion? Seeing here none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, before we get to the Ryan Reed show, let's have Ryan and Justin come on up, and we're going to talk about a Kohler diesel generator. Morning. Uh, Morning. The Office of Procurement in cooperation with the Bureau of Facilities requests your approval to award the purchase and installation of one Kohler diesel generator and 40 kilowatt transfer switch along with the removal of the existing generator and transfer switch. This is a turnkey project for Fidelity Power Systems in the amount of $77,987.45. This unit will be installed in the Louisville Tower on Louisville Road in Finksburg. Kohler Power System was awarded a competitively big contract through Sourcewell Cooperative Purchasing Consortium, which Fidelity is an authorized dealer. This amount is approved within the fiscal year 24 budget and no additional funds should be required. Commissioners, this tower <laughs> site plays an important role for the communication infrastructure throughout the county. Uh, due to the importance of the county operation, EOC 911, it's uh, critical that these uh, generators stay on target for the, the replacement scheduled through, uh, through budget that we worked with. Uh, this replacement falls within the county overall generator's budget and our plan, um, so we're looking for approval to uh, get this generator replaced and get a new one in there. The old generator we will sell 
um, on public purchase. How old is the old generator? 25 years old. Wow. Was a little, just a little over 8,000 hours. What is the expected average? Uh, um, the years, we go with a 25-year cycle here in yeah. uh, the county. But the hours, it kind of varies depending yeah. on the load that's on the generator and how often the generator runs. Right. Um, a lot of things that uh, these generators were fine and don't actually go past the lifespan because they don't run on a heavy load all the time. They just mm -hmm. sit there and run on an exercise cycle, mm -hmm. which is for a diesel engine, you guys know they are meant to run. Mm -hmm. um, so we do find some life expectancies don't hit that max light that we look for. Yeah. What happens to the old generator? Uh, well, we're going to bring it back to the shop and we're going to sell it on public purchase through the purchasing department. And then uh, the, whoever wins the bid will come in and pick it up. Motion to approve the purchase and installation of one Kohler diesel generator for the Louisville Tower to Fidelity Power Systems in the amount of $77,987.45. Second. I got a motion. I got a second. Any discussion on this one? Seen here none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. I wanted to say much. thank you to uh, you and your staff for some of the recent grounds improvements around the building here. It Absolutely. looks really good. Thank you. Everybody's been to the county building recently. They've known a lot of, we've seen a lot of new plants and shrubs. Ran into uh, Mr. Zepp and his crew out there yes, a couple yep. weeks ago working really hard. So it looks good. Thank I you. I appreciate that. And I'll uh, definitely pass the word along. Thank good. you, guys. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, let's look at buying some, uh, some vehicles. Mr. Oliver, come on up. And Ryan, let's talk about a Chevy Tahoe. Uh, um, the Office of Procurement, in cooperation with Fleet Management and Warehouse Operations, requests your approval to use FESCO emergency sales to complete the upfitting of one Fire EMS Chevy Tahoe in the amount of $35,595.55. And this includes all parts, labor, insulation, and delivery. This purchase is being made through a Howard, Con Howard County contract that was competitively bid. This amount is within the approved budget and no additional funds should be necessary. Because we have a, a list of items, I'll keep the presentations brief but available for questions. This is for the Chevy Tahoe that the board approved for purchase a couple weeks ago. When, um, when will it be on hand? We have the vehicle outfitting will take a couple months. I expect it to be prepared by the end of September. So I had a conversation with somebody else in the county government here recently about some of these vehicles when we order them. And one of the approaches being that if we don't get the vehicles by the time we were supposed to, whoever's got those vehicles and who's doing the work so starts paying us back money. In other words, if they don't deliver them on time, I don't know if this is the case or not, but I know Department of Fire and EMS is waiting for quite a few vehicles. so. I don't know if that's approach, an approach for the future, but um, it's not unheard of that if we order something and it's supposed to be here by September 1st and it's not, I think we have to hold some, some of the businesses accountable if they can't get it to us in time. So the, the delays with vehicles, um, that, that's one aspect of it, mm -hmm. and the actual process for outfitting, um, I think it has to be taken into consideration that everyone's sort of in the same boat as far as the delays so the outfitter um, if they need extended time to work on the vehicle I don't believe it's just because they haven't gotten to it or because they are postponing it um, in the fleet world everyone is waiting on parts um, but that's something we can look into I just think it might be a little bit difficult to enforce I understand it just seems like it might be worth something looking into when we're talking about months and months of waiting you know uh, so anyway just want to throw that out there yes sir I believe, just I believe this one was we bought off the lot though right correct we, we, we have the vehicle the lot. but yeah I think that's a, a maybe almost more of a legal question that we can we can look into certainly sure motion to approve the use of term contractor FESCO emergency sales to complete the upfitting of one fire and EMS Chevy Tahoe in the amount of thirty five thousand five hundred ninety five dollars and fifty five cents second motion second any more discussion on this one seen here not all in favor aye, aye. aye. Let's talk about the 325 Golf Compact Track Loader. 
All right. The Office of Procurement, in cooperation with the Bureau of Fleet Management and Warehouse Operation, requests your approval to purchase one 325G compact track loader from Jesco Incorporated in the amount of, <coughs> of $85,475. Jesco has been awarded Maryland um, blanket purchase order and this purchase will, will also be made using a source well contract which was awarded to John Deere Company, which Jesco is an authorized dealer. This amount is within the tw fiscal year 24 budget and no additional funds should be necessary. This purchase okay. would allow for the replacement of a 2008 John Deere skid loader that is currently used by the Bureau of Facilities on a daily basis. The new unit is expected to take between four and six months to receive. This is? Yes, sir. And we'll auction off the old? Yes, sir. Are we purchasing more than just this one at any given time? I mean, or is there going to be a need for additional? For FY24, this will be the only skid loader okay. purchase. Okay. Motion to approve the purchase of one 325G compact track loader from Jesco Incorporated in the amount of $85,475. Second. Motion second. Any discussion on this one? Seeing here none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Let's talk about the excavator. The Office of Procurement, in cooperation with the Bureau of Fleet Management and Warehouse Operation, requests your approval to purchase one XL4100 V6 by 4 hydraulic excavator from Elliott and France, incorporated in the amount of $525,938.42. This purchase will be made using source, a source well contract which was awarded to Great All Company, which Elliott and France is an authorized dealer. The amount is within the fiscal year 24 approved budget and no additional funds should be necessary. Hmm. Commissioners, this would allow for the replacement of a 2004 grade all currently in the fleet. It is used by the Bureau of Roads. Um, and uh, I think this week in this storm has really shown how critical this type of equipment is for the fleet. Uh, the great alls when paired with a grapple bucket is what's used to remove those large trees that have fallen in roadways and on power lines. Yep. Motion to, oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I was just going to say there's a couple of them out on 140. Yes, sir. With the poles, so. The county uh, has four of these units mm -hmm. um, looking to replace this one, and the new one is in stock and available. I expect it in a couple weeks. Okay, great. Cool. <laughs> Motion to approve the purchase of one XL4100 V 6x4 hydraulic excavator from Elliott and France in the amount of $525,938.42. Second. Got a motion second in discussion. See here none. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much. Uh, let's talk about the mower Max Boom. All right. The Office of Procurement, in cooperation with Bureau of Fleet Management and Warehouse Operation, requests your approval to purchase one mower Max Boom from Altman. At Max Equipment Company in the amount of $215,000. At Max Equipment Company was awarded a co cooperative contract with Byboard Purchasing Cooperative that will be utilized for this purchase. This amount is within the fiscal year 24 budget and no additional funds should be necessary. Commissioners, the Bureau of Roads had requested an additional boom miller for the fleet. Um, Currently, there are two boom mowers in the fleet, and again, these are another critical piece of equipment. As you can see, the boom mower is able to trim back tree lines, reach over and around fences and guardrails for brush mowing. Um, the unit that we are seeking your approval to purchase is a demo model. We did have the opportunity to test it out. It's a great machine, and because it's a demo model, we are receiving a $55,000 discount. And, and the purchase is everything in the photo? The, the vehicle and the boom? Correct. That's a good price. Yeah. Motion to approve the purchase of one mower max boom from At Max Equipment Company in the amount of $215,000. Second. I have a motion. I have a second. Any discussion on this? Seeing here none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Y'all on the roll. Keep going. Okay. 
The Office of Procurement, in cooperation with the Bureau of Fleet Management and Warehouse Operations, requests your approval to purchase one 2023 Mitsubishi Outlander Sport from Apple Ford in the amount of $29,595. This purchase will be made from Howard a Howard County contract that Carroll County will utilize. This amount is within the fiscal year 24 budget and no additional funds should be necessary. This allows for the replacement of a 2007 Jeep Liberty and the vehicle is primarily used by the Department of Land and Resource Management. Motion to approve the purchase of one 2023 Mitsubishi Outlander Sport AWD from Apple Ford in the amount of $29,595. Second. Apple Ford is selling a Mitsubishi. <laughs> I'm going to give... They have, uh, they have expanded. They have a Mitsubishi dealership. I am going to give... Apple Ford a hard time about selling a Mitsubishi because I know them well. Uh, is it uh, on the lot or is it being ordered? It is. It's, it's, it's on the lot. It's available for immediate yeah. purchase. Okay. Any uh, discussion on this one? Seeing her none, all in favor? Aye. 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 And let's talk about a 2024 Chevrolet Equinox that I expect is not being sold by Apple Ford. But I don't think so. <laughs> uh, the Office of Procurement in cooperation with the Bureau of Fleet Management and Warehouse Operations requests your approval to purchase 11 2024 Chevy Equinox from Hertrick Fleet in the amount of $290,092. This purchase will be made using Howard, a Howard County contract that Carroll County will utilize. This amount is within the fiscal year 24 budget and no additional funds should be necessary. These are all replacement vehicles for the Department of Public Works, the Sheriff's Department, and the State's Attorney's Office. 11 of them. Wow. What kind of a time frame, just out of curiosity? Do you uh, think? Six months. Six months, okay. Motion to approve the purchase of 11 2024 Chevrolet Equinox from Hertrick Fleet in the amount of $290,092. Second. Got a motion. I got a second. Any discussion on this one? Seen here, none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. <clears throat> Let's see. Let's talk about a used bucket truck. One's not me, I don't believe it. No, oh, Ryan, you go away. Oh, okay. I was yeah. going to say, I'm panicking now. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Sure, thank so you. Thank you. Good morning, Maureen. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. I thought I'd give Ryan a break. <laughs> but um, searches for a Ford F-550 <coughs> Altec bucket truck were conducted on eBay and Facebook Marketplace. Two trucks were listed on eBay and one being a 2012 truck that listed at $55,950 and one 2010 truck that listed at $54,998. A used 2009 truck listed on Facebook Marketplace for $49,500. A private sale for a similar truck was also investigated and this truck listed for $60,000. So uh, between the Office of Procurement and <coughs> Fleet Management, we are requesting your approval to purchase the one used 2009 Ford F-550 Altec bucket truck <coughs> from Edward N. Miller in the amount of $49,500. This is within the approved F F4 FY24 <coughs> budget and no additional funds should be necessary. And as a supplemental vehicle, this will be used for various projects around the county. Fantastic. Motion to approve the purchase of one 2009 Ford F-550 Alltech bucket truck from Edward N. Miller in the amount of $49,500. Second. I have a motion and second. Any discussion on this? Seeing here, none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great Thank you. job. Let's talk about uniforms. Commissioner, can I interrupt real quickly before oh, you gentlemen hey, Doug, leave? Yeah, Just gentlemen, I, I apologize. I didn't think you were leaving. I thought, have a seat. Just sit down for a second. I do want to uh, mention, not being rude by telling you to sit down, but <laughs> I, I do want to mention a lot of uh, discussion uh, earlier on was talked about um, <coughs> the uh, events over the last 48 hours um, and a lot of the hard work because it was, as we all know, catastrophic. It could have been more. It could have been worse, and the difference between 
you know, catastrophic and could have been worse is really razor thin. And um, the work that, you know, uh, Mr. Bokey and your entire team did uh, is just second to none. I mean, this county, I don't believe, has seen <coughs> the, the, uh, the debris, the 120 roads, the, um, the work that had to be done for the safety and quality of life of our county, Carroll County community. Um, I don't think they've seen that. Um, so the selfless work that I think we're down to five roads is what I'm told. Four we're now. down to four roads. It'll be updated shortly. New news. Okay. And uh, so from 120, just about 36 hours ago, whatever it may have been, to four is just remarkable in county roads. And, uh, you know, we, we do highlight, you know, our fire EMS and our uh, men and women in blue and also obviously in red. So I'm looking at them. Not so often uh, those that are often in yellow you know, and um, those that are there 24-7, you know, um, clearing these roads. So I think for me, my colleagues, a strong, strong appreciation, uh, Director Bogey and the entire team um, for being out there doing the work. Uh, and with that said, I'd like to open it up for comments if any of my colleagues may have. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to comment quickly and <coughs> and I don't want to diminish in any way the guys out there doing the work but on top of it it's been very good communication on the status of the work and in the areas and and that that makes it go smoothly also I'll just echo that as well I know we talked about it again earlier uh, thanking our road crews for everything they've done and for everybody who works in this county helping the county to get back on its feet so thank you very much gentlemen for that and God bless you and what you're doing. There's a lot of folks that are out there that are obviously not in this room um, and how to share, share our sentiments to them. Yes. Do your best uh, and we will also do our best. Uh, you know, saying thank you goes a long ways and it's a thank you from us, but uh, we'll continue to do that uh, to all the men and women that are out there still yeah. working. This goes a very long way. We truly appreciate it. Um, you're absolutely right. Uh, we have a few employees in roads operations, particularly, that have been with the county 45 years or more. Mm -hmm. And in their history, they have said that they have never seen this many roads closed at one time. Uh, they've been out there, and you're, you're also correct. You know, many other agencies work, and they work hard. But unfortunately, we don't have altering shifts of roads operators so they're out there 24 36 48 hours at a crack as you said working around the clock to keep it open and and remember without a passable road no one else responds anywhere there are no fire trucks go no police cars go no one goes anywhere and uh, it is heartening to hear you all recognize that and we will absolutely pass that along and many of them as time goes around uh, they will see this and they will truly appreciate it so thank you from the bottom of our hearts for recognizing that and if, absolutely and if I can and if I can add one second, um, I think of fleet a little bit like the 911 dispatchers of mm -hmm. the DPW world because if the gentlemen and ladies that run the trucks that clean the roads wouldn't be able to do it if the trucks and other equipment were not um, properly maintained um, by our fleet. So every hour that the roads crews are working, the fleet guys are working too. So right. uh, and maybe sometimes more. Um, so don't. I, I appreciate it and just uh, Brian before you just come up is also um, you put yourselves in harm's way and we often talk about you know red green blue putting ourselves in harm's way you put yourselves in harm's way every time you're out there um, especially in storms like this and uh, you know just uh, the character of the individual that is selfless um, the character of the individual that is is wet and cold and exhausted doing the work they're doing um, is just amazing. I don't think, uh, you know, there is another jurisdiction, and I'm just telling you straight up, that does the work that we do so well. So thank you. With the resources we With have. With the resources we have, yeah. Brian? Yeah, I was going to kind of mention that. And uh, 
Communication was mentioned. Um, we don't have a full dispatch. You know, we're, we're not like a 911 center out at, um, out at the maintenance center. You know, I've seen other jurisdictions that they have a full dispatch team that works around the clock. Um, we don't have that. We have staff that are volunteering to, to hang around all night. Um, shout out to Kathy Verts and her team. Um, she worked tirelessly these last couple nights. We were able to provide some support for her, even though we had to kind of pry her out of the seat um, to, to get these, these road closure updates. Um, um, and I, I was waiting for Doug to mention it, but um, that, that list that, that goes out every half hour, hour uh, during these events, um, that was something that was developed with BGE. And, you know, we that was a joint effort uh, to, to come up with that. They really like it. We really like it. And I think they've used that as a model for other counties. So just a shout out again to all those folks in the communication side of things and obviously the, the folks that are on the roads. Thank you. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. We Thanks. were the first to develop that, I understand, directly from uh, folks like Mike Fowler and others, and they have, um, they being, BGA has used it, uh, asked other jurisdictions to use right. it. No, I, definitely. Good coordination, good communication, collaboration, and all the rest. Any other uh, thoughts and comments on this? Okay, so whoever would want to leave, go ahead <laughs> get out of here. I apologize, uh, holding you up. They're probably um, pretty tired. <laughs> Maureen, uh, let's talk about uniforms. Hey, the Office of Procurement and the Department of Fire EMS were before the board in January of this year and received the approval to award a contract to the Whitmer Public Safety Group to purchase uniforms. The uniforms consist of shirts, pants, jackets, dress uniforms, uh, items, caps, and helmet fonts. We are requesting to continue the purchase of uniforms from the Whitmer Public Safety Group in the amount not to exceed $100,000 in the fiscal year 2024. This amount is approved in the FY24 budget and no additional funds should be required. And I'll turn it over to Michael to talk about the uniforms. Yeah, uh, th these uniforms will be attritional replacements um, mm -hmm. for the fiscal year. What we're finding out, we um, went ahead with a minimal issue of uniforms and obviously our people are out there working hard like the other night so uniform changes during a 24-hour shift are frequent and uh, uh, obviously the uniforms will wear out they'll rip they'll tear everything else um, so this will allow us to do attritional replacements as needed to start a stock level uh, within our warehouse with our quartermaster coming on board here in the next few months and uh, we still have some people that have been hired that haven't received all their uniforms so this will give us adequate funding in the fiscal year to handle that and uh, also I just want to take a moment to echo um, what's already been discussed here but I want to commend the um, team effort of the Department of Fire and EMS with our partners and the volunteers. Uh, we ran uh, over 200 calls during the storm. Uh, obviously some catastrophic events with unknown hazards, the first in units, obviously to Route 140 in Westminster. Um, those are high tension lines, 110,000 volts. We had no idea if they were still charged. We had a multitude of issues. Um, I ran about six or seven calls, including uh, a life-threatening uh, injury with someone bleeding out. Mm -hmm. um, we had multiple units. Some stations ran as many as 40 calls. And for an agency that's been operational for two months, it's really remarkable. And that's because our combination system and the partnerships that exist uh, is working. The volunteers had all 14 of our stations staffed. They had multiple units that were staffed. Um, myself and uh, the assistant chief were out there in the street. We also ended up at the EOC so we could fill the fire component of that out. And uh, without um, reiterating what you've already heard, uh, it was just a tremendous effort. It's not about one individual. It's really about the team effort and the leadership at all levels of our organization. So I just wanted to make sure that we had that acknowledgement here. Absolutely. I would just change one thing. It's not remarkable. It's Carroll County. I mean, and we're going to capture a lot of this information um, and package it because there are going to be lessons learned as well. But uh, it is what we do. So. Thank you. And, and our partnerships worked out well. And when the barrack commander came to me to tell me that yep. she was having a briefing and she wanted me there, yep. and as did the sheriff, it really uh, 
for the first time uh, really showed to us that we are part of the overall team for public safety. Absolutely. So it, it was a great, great experience, and we're glad that we could do our small part to make things better and uh, keep everyone safe. And other than one critical injury, uh, yeah. things went very well. That's incredible. And, and I, I think as much as I love saying I love Carroll County, you have such a great relationship with our surrounding jurisdictions mm -hmm. too that we can help them and they can help us when needed and that that's awesome also thank you okay yeah, th I just again thanks a lot chief uh, lieutenant Karolinko is here in the background you you were spread across at least seven different stations when this storm hit and it was evident by the response just again remarkable and thank you and you're you don't look really tired but i know you are so I'm <laughs> i got i slept a long t six hours last yeah, night six so hours. it's a okay, long chief, night for great. me <laughs> yeah i was coming off adrenaline as well it's like just hit you everybody so. looked bad yesterday morning so. <laughs> again chief thanks i know it's been a long week not a problem okay let's uh Let's approve these uniforms. Anybody got a motion? Motion to approve the purchase of uniforms of the Department of Fire and EMS from the Whitmer Public Safety Group at a cost not to exceed $100,000 in fiscal year 24. Second. I got a motion. I got a second. Any discussion on this one? Seeing here none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. okay thank thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's get a, an update on the status of the Carroll County's Office uh, of the State's Attorney Project. And appreciate we do have uh, also in the audience Mr. Culver, Mr. Stewart, as well. Gentlemen. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Is it morning still? Yes, yeah, still morning. Yep. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you for your time this morning. Been a, a busy agenda, um, but we're happy to give you an update on the status of the state's attorney's project. Um, Joining me this morning is Deputy Director Eric Boudine and our Director Brian Bokey in the back of the room. Um, the project is designed for, and I think we have uh, a rendering to show the building. Uh, Chris, if you could pull that slide up. Um, the building well, is that, designed there for you to use. That that PowerPoint's there for you. Okay. Minimize. It. Go to PowerPoint. That's right. <clears throat> there you go. Can everyone see the, the yep, rendering? You can make it a uh, portrait if you'd like. Bottom right corner. A little podium. There yeah, you yeah. go. Nope, oh, you had it. There. Okay. So th this is a rendering of what the state's attorney's building is going to look like. Um, again, it's a three-story office building <coughs> consisting of 26,000 gross square feet. It's going to be placed at the intersection of Ralph and Greenwood Street within the city of Westminster. Um, the uh, property was annexed into the city of Westminster corporate limits that annexation was necessary for us to obtain the necessary water allocations to serve the building. The two vacant structures on the building that you see in front of us are going to be demolished beginning on Monday, August 14th. And if you recall, we were before you a week or so to go to get your approval to award the contract mm -hmm. to one of our term contractors, HTI, to demo those buildings. And that was in the amount of $58,600. Um, just some more pictures of, of those buildings that, that will in fact be coming down. Also uh, in front of you, um, we provided two two drawings one is a drawing of bless you, bless you of the existing site conditions 
and that shows again what the photographs showed us the the buildings on the site there's some other smaller vertical structures that this existing condition plan represents uh, and then this is the actual site plan for the building um, with its orientation uh, there's a uh, entry level at the corner of Ralph and Greenwood which that area is kind of like grayed in um, on the I call it the east side there's uh, the Sally Port entrance that will provide secure entry into the building for state's attorneys needs when they have certain cases that they have to make sure it's secured um, so this gives you a, a representation of where the building sits on that property. Um, our bureau has been working very closely with our design team. The architect for this project, as you may see on the drawings, Mur Murphy and Dittenhafer, a firm located in Baltimore. Um, we've also been working with their subconsultants, Carroll Engineering, that's performing the civil engineering work. Uh, Ruling Associates has been performing our geotechnical uh, work, including soil borings to see what we have below the surface. Um, so again, we're working through multiple jurisdictional approvals, uh, including the City of Westminster and different agencies within Carroll County government. Um, the City of Westminster's Planning Commission granted conditional approval of the site plans in late July 2023. They had some relatively minor comments that we are addressing and we are going to be resubmitting those comments within the next week back to the city. Um, Carroll County Bureau of Engineering has issued their approval already. Uh, we obtained conceptual stormwater management approval from the Department of Resource Management and our civil engineer uh, resubmitted their point-by-point -point comments back to resource management on Thursday August 3rd that is the last set of comments that needed to be addressed so we can get final approval of, of the stormwater management for this site um, the architectural drawings for the project were submitted to Bureau of Inspections and Permits on Thursday, July 27th. Part of that uh, evaluation is <coughs> permits looks at ADA compliance, fire protection, plumbing, electrical, grading, and this is the second submission. Uh, the first submission we got very minimal comments, so we are looking to get approval on this set of architecturals and if not final approval minor comments to complete the architectural package um, let's see we're anticipating going to bid for the project in the fall of 2023 with construction anticipating to start in the spring of 2024 part of that will be kind of what kind of weather we have winter have you know not sure you know when to start a project in the dead of winter and have other issues to deal with um, the estimated time of construction is between 18 to 20 months um, we'll be happy to answer any questions or comments that you you may have at this time I love the great detail. Thank you so much. Um, and I think of interest to uh, maybe some people listening or watching. Can you say again when the current demo is going to start? And do you know if will that close any streets or can they stay contained on site when they do it? Mm -hmm. So the work's supposed to begin on Monday, August 14th. We're anticipating from start to end about two weeks we may have to do some maintenance of traffic on ralph street because of the billboard sign we're going to have a crane that will once we detach the posts from the sign itself the crane will be there to, to actually lift that mm -hmm. sign up and then oops dispose of that in in a 
a container. So for a few hours, there'll be some maintenance of traffic on Ralph Street. So, so no real road closures, more maintenance of traffic and some disruption. Correct. Um, gentlemen, do you have anything you want to share? Or uh, I, I know you're here with interest <laughs> on the status and timeline associated with this, but uh, and definitely not to put you on the spot, but to recognize that you are here um, and give you the opportunity if you do have comments. Well, well once again, we appreciate now that you've been evicted from. I apologize on the mic. <laughs> Good morning again. One, I mean, we have been technically evicted from the courthouse, Annex, so thanks for building us a new home, commissioners, and we really appreciate it. As, um, uh, we would like to remind the commissioners that um, we may seem impatient, but as you know, the longer anything takes, the more it costs. And uh, BOBC is doing what they can to move things along. We're finally getting some things over in Westminster. But like I said, getting the buildings demoed and seeing actual progress would, would be very nice. And we would also like to get a contract let as soon as possible uh, to get it done. But like I said, I, I believe we're over the major impediments. And um, like I said, we thank you for, and if like, we have, you have any concern or anything you need, we can talk about. We're just going to be the tenant, but we appreciate it. And, yeah. and uh, obviously, I'm more concerned about the public than you. But, <laughs> but, um, you guys have been doing regular progress meetings with them, talking back and forth for a good period of time. Correct. Yes, we have biweekly progress meetings with our architect and with Alan and Mike and the staff at the state's attorney's office. And if something comes up in the interim, we all stay in communication with each other to make sure yeah. we keep them advised of anything that may impact our schedule. Expectation, plus, plus or minus. Yeah. Expectation management, that's what this is all about right now, is you know, understanding the timeline, if there's delays, if there's issues, communicating it out, and then expect, you know, expectations on the next step. So I appreciate it, and that's... And, so and we do. It. We also thank you for the positions you gave us for uh, evidence review. But we're putting them in our conference room right now because <clears> we just don't have the space, and it's yeah. only going to get worse. And right. we'll, the, for the people of Carroll County, we actually need this building so we can actually prosecute crimes in in this century and the next one. So, okay, thank you. I do care I'm about sorry. you. You won't be here though. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> Any other? Uh, comments uh, this is really just a an update and a briefing on the status um, just a couple of, of questions and maybe a thought too so I mean it, the the and, and maybe this this seems like I'm being I don't know I'm, I don't, picky may not be the right word but but aesthetically concerned the 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 architectural uh, facade uh, image that we have there all right mm -hmm. well, at, what is what are those giant metal things that are going up and down on the front of the building and to the side? Um, let's see. It looks like corrugated roof, but it's sideways. Like it's. Uh, there, therefore, the the um, the sun to keep the to keep the sun from from uh, causing too much of an issue through those windows is my understanding, right? I mean, they, they did a. God, what's the, the term for the study? Some a solar study, I guess it. you'd call it, yeah. from the the, direct, the direction the sun moves, and and those are those fins are to uh, block the the bulk of the sunshine. It's a but, but still allowing but still allowing uh, daylight into the building. It's 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 a atrium in that front entrance of the building, mm -hmm. so that atrium really goes up all three levels. So to Eric's point, those what you would call fins allow us to get l light into the building without creating a negative impact. Right. Too much heat, too much light, but we still get natural <coughs> light, which was part of the design elements mm -hmm. when we were working with the architect on, on the building in the early stages of design. And I'm, I'm curious about that because, again, I, I you know, in, a lot of things that we've talked about uh, over the last couple of months, for example, uh, the moratorium on solar, uh, because we didn't feel that it had a uh, you know, fittingness with, with our county. Um, you know, I, I, there, there was this school of thought, I think it was in the 50s or the 60s, it came about architecturally that form follows function, right? And I reject that school of thought completely because the life does not come from the design of the building, but from, or does not come from the form of the building, but from the design of the building. 
And so I worry that if, I mean, I'm, and again, I'm not trying to be mean. I look at this and it just doesn't seem like this fits for our, our county and for this, this, for the city of Westminster. And, um, and I'm not talking about the, the function that it's going to be mm -hmm. used for, but, you know, we're looking at this building long term. And, and while in 2023, this looks like a phenomenal modern architectural rendering of a building, you know, 40 or 50 years from now, is this going to qualify as something classic? Is this going to qualify as something that can be used long term? Um, you know, let's say 50 or 60 years from now, the, the state's attorney has to move to another building. And what do we knock this down because it's so incongruently designed right now? And so I'm, I'm just wondering whether or not there may be uh, opportunities to, to, to refine the aesthetic appearance of this building to make it more uh, uh, in, in keeping with the other buildings that are around, but also with an eye toward its future use. I don't know whether we're past that stage or, or whether or not these have been approved or what the case is, but I just, I didn't want to let this go without going on record, uh, being that this is taxpayer money that's going into this building, that we're not just thinking about 2023, but 2053 or 2073. Now, your point's well taken, and um, early on when, when this building was being uh, designed, the brick is designed to match the brick that's on the annex building. So we're tying that architectural element together with what we're calling the old style. And we're taking what they call Georgian style architecture, mm -hmm. uh, which was the older style buildings that we have, but then bringing it into a more contemporary mm -hmm. facade which is why you're seeing some of these elements on that entry level area. So uh, thought was, a lot of thought was given to past as well as future um, design and uh, architecture can be very subjective. <laughs> so um, it, it's, yeah, let me have uh, Mr. Boki speak. For yeah, a so I, I'll, uh, Commissioner Wrigley, I, we went through a long process with the City of Westminster um, Planning Board and, and what the design was going to look like. We can definitely provide you some additional renderings on, on how it fits um, in, into the city and, and what some of their comments were, um, because I think it's definitely kind of in the same vein of, of these questions you were asking. And I also want to add, you know, the, the, the long-term goal of this Greenwood campus is a public safety campus. So there, there is going to be other buildings that are kind of going to blend in with this entire campus, whether it's the um, Sheriff's Headquarters, Detention Center, all the way out to the County Office Building. I, I think there is going to be a nice um, feel for this, for this government center. I, and I very much appreciate that. And I would certainly like to see those because, again, and, and again, I'm not trying to be unkind or, or you know, demeaning or anything, but it's just, it's it's so incongruently put together. It seems because you have a more traditional architecture with something that is very postmodern, and and again, it's it's you know, I want the state's attorney to have a space that is going to be functional for them, but I also want this to be a space that is something that we're going to be proud of 50 years from now. We're not going to look at it and say, oh, well, you can definitely tell that's from 2023. Where again, even though the, the goal long term is to have the state's attorney there, again, what happens is if in 50 years they decide they do have to move somewhere else. Right. Um, and then while I appreciate and respect that in 2023, we're looking at that as a long term uh, uh, campus for public safety. Again, who knows what 50 or 100 years from now is going to end? I mean, you know, you go back 150 years, and the 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 jail over on you know over on uh, the other street would have been perfect. The sheriff was living over top of the prisoners that he was overseeing. And in this day and age, it would be unheard of for any law enforcement official to be living with his family over top of the prisoners that you're watching. So, yeah. understood. Thank you. Well, Thank you can't speak for the others but Commissioner Kyler and I will not be here in 50 years but, <laughs> uh, and so I, I think just too, um, and, and I understand what you're saying East Middle for instance there was the architect thought a lot about how does this match city of Westminster how does this match mm -hmm. the current stuff and unfortunately and you're not quite there yet um, we then got bids in and found out we were seven to 12 million over budget and we had to do value engineering and some of that went away and we we had to change we had to sacrifice a little bit of what we thought was blending with the community because of the dollars because mm -hmm. we couldn't afford it and it's 
it's so hard to time the market. We tried to, with, with Career and Tech and East Middle, beat the inflation and beat the other schools being built throughout the state. Um, and that's like trying to time the stock market. Mm -hmm. You know, you sometimes you get lucky, sometimes you don't. So um, my, my gut feeling is the quicker this moves, hopefully the better the pricing will be. But you just don't know that. You don't know what's going to change it. But there, there could be some changes because of value engineering as you get further along into this. M Mr. Stewart has a couple stock tips for us. No, I, <laughs> I just want to, you, uh, Commissioner Viglado, you echoed what uh, those of us who are planning and zoning for uh, at Westminster, particularly um, council, Common Councilman Hoff had the same issue. This does not do justice. You will be getting some better renderings. And I say, uh, the, a picture is worth a thousand words. Please look at another picture before you make up your mind, because this does not do justice to what it actually looks like. So. And, and, and Mr. Stewart, please uh, don't take me the wrong way either. My bringing this up is not any attempt to, to, to delay this or to postpone it. I want this done. I just want to make sure that it's done right and it's done justice by the taxpayers of the county as well as by you guys too. Sure, and we, we understand you're paying for it and, and it and it should be, but like I said, this does not, once we show the renderings to uh, uh, Councilman Hoff, he had a different, he had a change of heart. And right, Mr. Bowers? Correct. You, you were there. That's correct. Well, th thank you for that. Okay, what else do we want to talk about? Anything else? Nothing else on there unless you have any further nope. questions. Nope, just question. again, continue uh, the great collaboration that you are doing and uh, communication uh, back to us on any changes or uh, updates that you believe we should uh, be aware of at any given time, okay? Will do. Gentlemen, thank you, thank gentlemen. you so thank much. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thanks. Absolutely. Good luck. Mr. Either. Zaleski, why don't you uh, come on up and uh, let's have a presentation and discussion on the actuary study for public safety pension plan. And for the hard questions, we have Jenny. Easy questions, hard questions. Yep. And, and, uh, Sounds good to me. We, we had a caller, and I don't know if yeah, that related caller, to this topic, you know, but we can take public comments on this topic, and we can also do it at the end of the meeting in <clears> general, <throat> correct? Yes. Um, well, what's interesting is we don't have, bear with me a second, just bear with me. The agenda says public comment on this item. That's why I asked. No, the no, no. I, and that, that's what I was yeah, looking. Yeah. I'm, I'm going back to the. Yeah. So. Um, no, this is. And I don't know that we have any, but I just wanted to mention that. What? PowerPoint. Oh. Um. <laughs> so. Brilliant. It's good. I I, I appreciate that. Um, Ted, would you like to? Uh, Think we should get public comments, if any, prior to your conversation, or uh, totally up to you. Okay. Um, are there going to be any public comments, uh, Chris? Do you have anybody on the line? Yes, sir. But I'm I'm not sure if that's for general public comment or for this item. Let me check. Okay. Thanks. And are there going to be any public comment? Go ahead, Chris. Caller hit star six you can unmute are you calling about this particular item star six you can unmute caller can you hear me yes can you hear me yes uh no i'm i'm calling for a general public comment okay, okay. Thank, thank you very much are there any public comments that are going to be said in here Limited to beforehand, or yes. can we go after this is? Nope, before. To give us your thoughts on what you want to share. We don't know what we're even going to be discussing. We've okay, let's go through the, uh, the discussion, presentation. If you're going to have public comments, fill out one of the salmon cards in the back, and we'll go from there. 
Go ahead, Ted. Okay, we're here to talk about potential changes to the public safety pension. Uh, the board a while back directed us to get an actuarial study to take a look at what some changes might look like. Uh, I'm not here today to advocate for this or to argue against it. I'm just sharing the information that we got so that you can think about where you might want to go. Uh, I will say if we're going to act on this, uh, this will be a, a significant budget item. Uh, I think we need to be whatever th thoughts you have need to go along with all other budget thoughts you have. Uh, I don't believe we can just simply look at this as a standalone item. First, a little history. Um, there used to be just one pension plan. In 2009, a law enforcement pension plan was created separate from a civilian plan. Uh, for law enforcement, the retirement date changed from 30 years of service or 62 years old to 25 years of service and 55 years old. Uh, the multiplier, uh, the how we determine what the eventual dollar benefit will be, what do you multiply times not the number of years and salary, et cetera, changed from 0.7% to an average of 2.01%. That says an average because there's several layers in the law enforcement plan that have different multipliers. Uh, we're not going to get into that today, but at some point you want to go deeper into those kind of things, we can have the right people here for you to talk about that. Um, the correctional officers at that time remained in the civilian plan, but they had a multiplier change from 0.7 to 1.8%. In 2017, correctional officers were added to the law enforcement plan. They also made a change to increase um, the value of military service to the plan. 2020, there were improvements to the disability benefit in the plan. Uh, catastrophic changes went from 30% to 45% for law enforcement and from 0 to 45 for corrections. Uh, catastrophic, and this is a very simple definition, but basically saying you can't work anymore. Non-catastrophic changes went from 0 to 35 for both, and non-catastrophic would be you can't do the job that you have now, but you could do something else. And then at the same time, uh, earned income offset was eliminated. There was a provision that if you are working and making money, some of that would count against your pension benefit. That was eliminated, so there is no impact. In 2021, the law enforcement plan changed to a public safety pension plan, which includes law enforcement corrections and now our new fire and EMS. And also another change um, gave credit for academy time and time served as a correctional officer if you moved into one of these other jobs. So the request, and I have to say here, we don't actually have a request, we don't have a budget request from the sheriff for this item. Uh, there, there have been discussions between the commissioners and some individuals that led to what I'm calling the request here. Uh, included in that would be a 75% retirement benefit, two-thirds disability benefit, uh, a constant 2% COLA, a program that is called DROP, which we'll come back to in a second, and a desire to make all these benefit changes retroactive to current employees who didn't have those benefits. So we had an actuarial study done. I want to say a couple things about that. Uh, first, it's complicated stuff. You know, it's, it's not easy to just read and say, and say, okay, got it. And there is no answer. Uh, lots of times people want to say, well, what will this cost? And there's no answer to that question. What the actuaries do is make a series of assumptions uh, and then try to make calculations, projections based on those assumptions. But we know none of those assumptions are what will really happen. It's just the best shot at what will the, what do we think this is going to look like and they have to make a, a series of assumptions and in the plan they also ran several different scenarios so there are different ways you could look at this 
And there are also a number of pieces to this. Uh, this is not an all or nothing that you do all of these things for this price tag or nothing. Uh, there are many paths you could go down. So what will it cost? Again, can't answer this with certainty. And yeah, I talk about these assumptions. There are a lot of variables here. Uh, how many actual retirements and when will, there, will we see? How many deaths will we see and when will we see them? How many terminations? What disabilities will uh, occur? Um, the disability question is, is an important one. Uh, if we increase benefits, it's reasonable to assume that uh, you'll see greater use of those benefits. Uh, salary increases. We don't know what all those will be in the future. That has an impact on this. And then investment performance. Uh, money is tied to this in, in investments. How well we're doing or how poorly we're doing at any time you know, changes what this costs. So from the study, based on all the assumptions that they made, if we think about all the changes that are asked for with the exception of the drop, uh, we think this would cost approximately $6 million a year. That would be to provide all the benefit increases that I talked about earlier. Uh, uh, if you do less, of course, the cost goes down. That will depend on what changes you make. Uh, another variable I didn't mention is uh, how much pension members contribute to the benefit. Uh, the greater their contribution is, the lower the tax dollar contribution needs to be. Um, I do want to say the study did not look at providing the benefits retroactively. So that $6 million a year is to provide new benefits looking, looking forward. Um, I can't even put a, a, an estimate on what I think a retroactive would be, but of course that would make that a good bit more expensive. Now, uh, that did not include the drop. Uh, I'm gonna suggest to you that you maybe, if you, if you want to get into a discussion about the drop, and I'll define this in a second, uh, that you might wanna make that a separate discussion from the rest of these uh, pension changes. But a drop, and again, this is overly simple, but basically, uh, this is a program where somebody in this plan can declare their retirement, continue working. They begin collecting their retirement benefits, but they're held in an account on the side. They don't actually get the money. And then one day when they actually do retire, uh, they will receive the money that has been collected. Um, now, sometimes there are arguments made that this is cost neutral, that you would be paying somebody one way or, or another. And I understand the argument. Uh, now that he's been around for a while, there are, there's some thinking that that's not necessarily true or not always the true, that you, know, you have some behavior changes. Um, you're holding on to experienced, higher paid officers longer. Um, but again, it, we can talk more about those kind of things if, if you decide to pursue that. And Ted, what does DROP stand for? Delayed retirement? Some Third Retirement Option Program. I'm sorry, say that again? Third Retirement, Third retirement Option, Option Program. Program. Thank you. Um, so you were in the ballpark. <laughs> <laughs> Almost there. <laughs> so uh, this was to get the information in front of you. The, the, the biggest piece of information, of course, is what's the magnitude of the, right. the dollar commitment that we're talking about here. Uh, as we... Um, look ahead, you know, what are the next steps? I think there needs to be some, some discussion on what is it you're willing to consider. Uh, that could be anything from we're willing to talk about all of this to we're not willing to talk about all this, but we are willing to talk about these pieces or to this degree. Mm -hmm. um, when are you willing to consider these changes? Uh, you can't decide this today because it's not on the agenda that way, but you could in theory take it up next week if you, if you want to. Uh, going back to what I said earlier, I would encourage you to make this part of larger budget discussions. You know, we're not talking about spending $600, we're talking about spending millions of dollars annually. And uh, we already have significant pressures. I don't see how we can separate this from all the other stuff we need to talk about. And then when we have a better idea what it is that you want to do, what paths you want to pursue, we can put together a work plan to uh, build 
um, more information to try and put you in a position to, to talk through the things you need to talk about and to see uh, what kind of implications we are up against. And then much like um, you know, going through the proposed budget sessions, I think we probably could put th together things to allow you to play with different scenarios. Mm -hmm. Like um, if we requ require a contribution of X percent or Y percent, what does that do? If we give a 75% retirement benefit or a 65% reti retirement benefit, what, do, what impact does that have? The, um, the, the drop, it sounds like that's um, from a military perspective, the Reserve National Guard, it's a deferred retirement program. When you retire, you don't collect until you hit a certain age, as opposed to you know, active duty, you collect as soon as you retire. So it sounds like that's what that drop sounds is. Sounds similar, but yeah. um, w with these, it's not tied to a age you reach. It's tied to a retirement date that's been declared. So um, you, know, you could say, I'm going to work for three more years. The, the drop yeah. is tied to that three years. Got it. OK. OK. Are there any comments? I mean, do we want to hear from the public now and then at that point? OK. I see a couple salmon cards. If you can give them to either Tim or Roberta. And then. Uh, Chris, if you can put the clock up and we will, uh, you know, intend to keep it to uh, three minutes. Um, reminder that this is not an uh, opportunity for discussion. It's an opportunity for transmit, receive uh, information. And, you know, I'm pretty liberal when it comes to three minutes, but I'll remind people to complete their thoughts that's a very big three there we, there we go okay I'll try not to take it all um, uh, and I apologize for not wanting to go beforehand we just did, we weren't sure what Mr. Zaleski I, I, I was say, even say. say who you are and where you come or where you're Brandon Allen I'm the president of the FOP Lodge 20 here in Carroll County yep um, commissioners we've all talked about this either privately in group discussions um, about enhancements to our retirement system especially disability pensions um you know we have a bunch of deputies out there right now who are going on minimal sleep they're standing with their back to traffic in altered traffic plans just hoping that someone who's late for work doesn't plow into the back of them um, commissioners everyone around us is already made these enhancements to their pension systems i, I shouldn't say everybody a good majority of the public safety pension systems around us have already made this and i think it's time that carroll county stops acting like we're in a bubble that nothing's ever going to happen here that we decide our own market for what we're going to pay our employees the benefits that we're going to provide to our employees all right we need to get on board you all don't decide the market mr zaleski he doesn't decide the market everywhere around us decides the market of what it costs to run public safety police fire you name it okay it's time that we all get on board we can't just keep saying we're going to write our own ship and we're going to say what this is going to cost because it doesn't affect the public it affects the employees that you that fall under you um, and i'm not i shouldn't even really say that this is only public safety this is every county employee in this building um, over at Rhodes. We are all tired of being told, oh, well, this is Carol, we'll just pay you this, while everyone else is going forward, getting better benefits, better pay. Um, so I'll, I'll just give a plug to everybody here. I think it's time that Carroll County gets on board with all of it. All right, I told you I'd try not to take my whole three minutes. Okay. So. Thanks, ma'am. Okay, thank you, Brandon. The only else? other comment card I have is Mike Karolinko. And Mike, you do not get three minutes, 45 seconds. <laughs> not this time, at least. Uh, the, so, Brandon uh, didn't cede them to him, so that's why. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Michael Karolinko, president of the Carroll County Professional Firefighters and Paramedics Association. Um, you know, just to reiterate a lot of the things that <laughs> President Holland had to put out is, you know, with us coming on board, this, I'm looking at six months into 30 years. You know, we're, we're looking at 
the the weight of you know not only the the years that have already served in Carroll, but us as employees, your employees, serving this community moving forward. What we're emptying out every single day. You know, Brandon put out some of the little hazards there and everything else, but let's talk about the long term and the quality of life when we look at the end of all this. Cancer is the leading cause of firefighter deaths right now. Occupational cancer. So way above the you know the risk on that. You know, so when we're retiring at the end of this, when we empty ourselves after, out after 25, 30 years, what is the quality of life that we're looking at? And after we've invested our life, our, our well-being, our hours with our family, you know, stepping out for the, the storm's been talked about nauseam today. <laughs> you know, guys were stepping up to the plate, working a lot of hours and putting themselves in harm's way for that. So after countless of those scenarios over the course of their career in Carroll County, what's their quality of life going to look like when they retire? What's the thank you? to all the investment and risk that they put out there, the strain on their family and everything that they put out, then as they live out those years. So the life expectancy for a firefighter is disgusting. It's low. Our gear, we found out, you know, we had a huge conversation about PFAS in the ground. PFAS is in our gear. So we're constantly being exposed with these plastics that are burning around us constantly that we're stepping into in all these incidents. What does is, what is the county support look like to us at the end of the, end of the day? And I'd have to say that, you know, along, along lines of what Brandon was saying, this is Carroll County stepping up to the plate. You know, counties around us have better, better uh, percentages on retirement. They have, they have the drop program. They already have a lot of these benefits. And we're sitting in the shadows going, well, it's Carroll County. You know, the last uh, individual, you know, on the last board, you know, very aptly, I know, it was right in the fact that we want to work in Carroll County. But that's not the only factor. And we have to have the you know, the whole piece to keep us here. And this is a massive retention issue. I mean, look at the, the police department, the, the, the sheriff's office could go into recruitment issues just as well the fire department's talking about it right now. When we're competing against all these other jurisdictions, this stuff matters. And, the, you know, the employees are looking at it. So if, you know, they're, they're thinking about where they're going from here, that's, it's, it's a concern when we have that experience walking out the door. And I, I, I'd really just, I'd, I'd petition for a much more in-depth conversation and process on this issue moving forward that brings in the, the you know, kind of the, the broader conversation of the, um, the employee, the, you know, the provider, the, the, the police officer, the, the fireman, to, to be part of how this works moving forward with you. Um, we have to do it right. This is the health of our system. It's the safety of our county. And it's, it's you taking care of the people that are working for you serving in your county. So I, I really appreciate it, and I look forward to this moving forward with five seconds left. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, and I do see uh, Chief and our Sheriff, if uh, either one of you would like to make a comment, feel free. And I'm not going to have that three I minute. Would, I, I think w he and I are looking for a broader discussion on it is what it amounts to where where do we go from here after the actuarial has been discussed and how do we discuss this and and i think in talking to to brandon and the folks on my side and, re and i'll remind you that the correctional deputies fall under the same okay. pension system i think the the broader discussion is is there give and take like ted said what what do we do with the percentages what is right. what is your what are you looking at what what can we what can we move forward and, and think that we can afford now and then look down the road? But these guys are right. Um, everybody around us has got a much better pension system than, than what we have right now, and, and it's time that we discuss it and, and figure it out. So I, I'm sure Mike will reiterate what yeah. I've said. Um, thank you. Just to reinforce what's already been said, and uh, the sheriff and I have an advantage because we're the products of other retirement systems, mm -hmm. and uh, we're here for different reasons and what, what I'm looking at as I create a department is being able to recruit the best but the biggest challenge is the retention mm -hmm. and so probably one of the biggest issues besides salaries that people look at when they come in is what's the long-term game plan uh, particularly in terms of retirement and post-employment benefits so I'm not here today to focus in on any one issue but I think the discussion uh, for public safety needs to take place because we're part of that uh, greater Baltimore Washington market which includes Northern Virginia and there is a lot of competitive elements out there among other agencies I think Carol has some very unique qualifiers that bring people here and there's people here particularly residents within Carroll County that want to come here and make a career but to make that career viable I think we have to look forward to the future and enhancement of those benefits but there is a cost to that and so there's other dynamics uh, we'd love to have a, a greater discussion and uh, be included at some point thank you no, thank you gentlemen and um, you know we made a uh, 
a conscious decision <clears throat> uh, upon the completion of our last budget, um, I won't say season, but decision-making process that uh, we were to have further discussions on budget as soon as we initiate the FY24. And we've had work session, we'll have additional work sessions, um, you know, through uh, the next quarter, next couple quarters before we start uh, our actual deliberation um, in, you know, pretty much March, February, March of, um, of next year. This uh, is going to be a part of that discussion that, like you said, uh, Sheriff, the, the broader discussion. Um, you know, there's, there's a handful of topics, you know, it's kind of the big rocks in the jar, you know, that, uh, you know, have to be considered. And one of those big rocks is safety security and how do we get the best of the best and retain, recruit and retain uh, the best of the best. So that's that broader discussion that's going to be taking place. Um, you know, uh, communications is important, so continuing to keep you informed, I think, is uh, going to be critical. And, you know, getting the best ideas, I think, also um, is critical. So having you, you know, whether participate or provide information, you know, I mean, it's always an open door, and you know that. And uh, crosstalk is, is huge. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's my opening thoughts on this. Does anybody have any other additional thoughts? I agree. I want to have the discussion about this. I want to, you know, like you said, I want to be able to provide what we can for the people who serve us. And on that note, you know, heading into these discussions, I'd like to, I guess maybe the right phrase for this would be scenario. I'd like to see a couple of different options that we may have. For example, uh, you know, if it's 75% uh, uh, retirement and 66 and two-thirds, I think you said the cost without drop is about $6 million a year, only looking forward but not retroactively, correct? Right. All right, so if, if we were to do different graduated numbers, like 70% or 65% retirement, um, you know, is this, is this necessarily something that we – uh, you know, as had been mentioned by others, is this necessarily something that all has to happen at once? Are there certain things that we can phase in over time? Um, and again, I'm looking forward ahead, as Commissioner Rossi had mentioned, we're faced with a number of large rocks. You know, we are starting out fiscal year 25, $7 million in deficit. And that's even before we've added all the additional costs onto Blueprint. And so I'd certainly want to, to see what options we have to be able to, to implement some of these things. You know, I. I I agree that we, we it's time for us to have the discussion about this and, and being able to determine what we can afford to do and when. You know, on scenarios, uh, going back to what I was saying a little bit earlier, there's an infinite number of them. Mm -hmm. um, so what would be really helpful is if we get back something from the board indicating the scenarios you want to see or at least we'd like to see five versions of each of these benefits right. or something, but even there, you start combining version three of this benefit and version mm -hmm. one of this benefit, you know, it, it adds up quickly. Uh, I, I don't want to dump unnecessary work on the budget analysts and put time into something that's not going to get discussion. But that said, um, you know, we'll, we'll do whatever you need. On the idea of phasing it in, uh, I, I would suggest that really isn't part of this conversation because the financial difficulties we have right now go as far as, far as we're looking. There's, there's not a date where we can say, well, if we can just get through these years, then we can phase something in. Uh, I think if, you're, if, you're, if you look to make changes, I don't believe there's any particular benefit to us phasing those changes. If you're going to do them, I think you just do them. Yeah, I think, um, Good point. again, during those work sessions, doing our due diligence to provide more specified, you know, guidance um, and end up being tasks back to you and your team to come back to us uh, is going to be necessary is what you're asking. And I, I agree with you. You know, we can't just say do all because it, we're not going to get there. So, um, yeah, please. Yeah, um, a couple comments. Um, and, and yes, this is Carroll County and uh, um, surrounding counties have their problems as well as, as how they pay and, and their benefits. To me, we need to look at 
environment, the schedules we have here in Carroll County, and pay and benefits. Um, and and as far as being part of the discussion, the real stakeholders here are the taxpayers of Carroll County. And uh, if if some of these employees <clears throat> don't live in Carroll County, they're not stakeholders. They don't they don't help pay the bill. Um, if you guys want us to hear, and you've never been shy before, um, send us emails. Let us know um, um, how much are you, as the employee, willing to give up towards benefits. Um, what happens if benefits increase and pay doesn't increase quite as much? I mean, it's all compromise. It's all. Um, and, and, and Sheriff, you mentioned, can we afford this? And, and that's a big part of this. Uh, in, a, in, a, in an ideal world, I'd love to, that our teachers got more pay than Baltimore and Howard County. Um, again, a different industry. Right now, we're getting, we're getting educators from Baltimore County because they're not happy there and they're giving up pay to come here. So it's, it's not all about the dollars, but it's the whole picture. And, and I, I'd love to hear you guys comment on, on you know, not, and, and you haven't said this, but not just I want benefits, but, you know, is the employee willing to contribute to the benefits? Is, mm -hmm. is uh, while, while Carroll County may pay less than Montgomery County, um, there are some positives to being in Carroll County, which you all said. I know you all recognize it, but... Um, and, and uh, this, we did commit to do the actuarial study to get all this started and, and, and talk about it. And that in itself is complicated. But then I think when we look at the different, you know, pay versus benefits versus schedule versus living in Carroll County or working in Carroll County, again, we talked all about the storm. And uh, the first responders have stepped up and done a great job. Um, my neighbors helped me clear a road. Um, I'm not sure that would have happened in eastern Baltimore County. No offense if you're listening. Um, <laughs> but, you know, so, so we are blessed to be here. And we've, we have to look at, and, and, and you made a good comment, uh, next year isn't our worst year ever. It's, uh, it's going to be pretty constant moving forward on expenses, and we really need to look at what we can afford and what we can't but and I think we've said that with during the actual world study we can't ignore this this is something we need to look at and and in some in some fashion we probably need to implement something I'm just not sure what that fashion is right now but um, you never bring us anything easy, <laughs> but, but I, yeah, I just wanted to kind of say my thoughts about, it. yes, yes, this is important and we've got a, a lot of important issues, but I think we need to look at, um, I'd, I'd love to hear what, what the different groups want and, and, uh, and I'm sure we will. Yeah. <laughs> Any other thoughts at this time? Well, I think. You know, we've all kind of said this up here, and I'm just going to go out on a limb for a quick second. But, you know, I think it is, I think all of us have at least committed to sitting down and having this conversation and looking at it. We're in the very early stages of this. Um, none of us know where this is going to go. As Ted pointed out, there's a wide array of options and possibilities. But I think the bottom line is everybody is at this table. We all want to talk. And I think the best thing we can do is continue to move forward with this. We're not ignoring it. I know I'm not ignoring it. I, I think my colleagues are not ignoring it. I think the thing is just to start this conversation and see where we can take this and move forward. So at, at this point, I think you know the best thing we can do is just start having, whether we want to set up conversations at whatever period of time, I would like to see us do that and see where everybody's coming in from the various stakeholder groups and you know what we can look at. And, and to, to make those conversations happen, because it was a good point about the public comment that you kind of needed to hear what was going to happen before you could comment about it. This presentation, the facts about this, the actual act actuarial study, um, how are they available? Does that take a PIA request? Or now that we've done this, it, they're, they're, they're available yeah. by just asking? Yeah. yeah. We always try to... Um, 
if it's easy, something like this, we would just email it. You know, we yeah. try to avoid the formality of a PIA request if we can do yes. so. Okay. We try to limit those to the things that really require time and attention. Yes, if, yes. If we have yes. that opportunity to communicate yes. that with someone before they. Yes, I, and I just felt like everybody listening ought to hear that. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. Anything else? For the good of the group. Okay. Thank you so much for discussion. And continue as I would expect both Brandon, Mike, and all to reach out. Thank you, guys. <clears throat> okay. We're at a point. Um, Chris, public comment. Yes, caller that's on the line, can you please use star six to unmute? You'll have three minutes to make public comment. Please identify yourself and tell us what area you're calling from. Okay, thanks. This is Stephanie Ramirez, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, ma'am. Um, good morning, um, briefly before I start, um, I went through a drive through earlier about an hour and a half ago and the gentleman, when I pulled up, he said, that sounded like the voice of God. So whoever was speaking about an hour and a half ago, I'm sorry, I don't remember who it was. I think you have a really good voice, apparently. Um, good morning. I wanted to thank everyone for the opportunity to speak about a very serious issue that is negatively affecting the families of Carroll County. Um, as a whole, Carroll County is well known for being family friendly. Unfortunately, the Carroll County judicial system, specifically the Carroll County specific court, is failing our families. In just one case, a specific Carroll County uh, judge has refused to enforce his own orders, ignoring 10 petitions for contempt that covered over 100 dates of denial of court orders. This judge has also shown bias and double standards. I only have three minutes to speak, so I won't be able to get into specific examples but I'm available to speak after this if anyone has any questions. I have seen what this judge has done and continues to allow to be done to my family for the last four years. To say what this judge has done and allowed is a living hell that would be a vast understatement. The damage that has been done to my children may never be repaired, but I am praying that with your help and the help from the community that this judge will never have the opportunity to fail another Carroll County family. This judge is retired speaks and laughs during active court proceedings in directions where no one is standing. While I cannot speak to the mental state of this Carroll County judge, speaking and laughing to himself during an active court proceeding could explain some of the refusal to enforce his own orders. Perhaps he is just not paying attention, but my children, Carroll County children, are paying the price for his inattention or bias, whatever the case may be. Judge Stansfield has failed and refused to enforce his own court orders on dozens of occurrences. Please help me ensure other Carroll County families never have to deal with this situation. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Before you uh, go, I, I honestly did not catch your name and where you're calling from. Stephanie Ramirez, Tawny Town. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Chris, anybody else on the line? That's it, sir. Okay. Um, <laughs> as we're passing signatures around, just gentlemen, bear with me for one second. Um, does everybody have the uh, MAKO priority document? Um, hopefully. Uh, and I'm going to get myself in order so I don't mess this up. <clears throat> so, you know, sitting on the uh, the board, we um, had I think it was about 42. I think it was 42 legislative items that we start with, and the intent is to get down to three to five prioritized legislative items that we want, we as MAKO, um, all jurisdictions to, uh, to carry forward and to prioritize talking with our legislators um, across the state. 
what you have in front of you is, I think, about 20 um, legislative uh, topics. Um, mm. The staff of MAKO you see below, and it'll say what the staff's recommendation is to keep it on list. Now, the intent is when we go down to uh, MAKO next week, um, there's a legislative meeting and also a board meeting where we're going to work to narrow this down to, uh, it's not going to be the three to five we want, but it's going to be closer than we are now. So what I'd like is for us to take a, a look at this and, um, you know, what are the, and, and get your ideas and thoughts and ideas, what are the topics, they're all very important topics, but what are the ones that you believe we should focus our attention on for the good of Carroll County and the Carroll County community? Um, like I said, if you read every one, they're all very important, but where do we want to spend most of our uh, energy? So I, uh, I did take the time to review them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, being relatively new as a commissioner, I'm still, in my own mind, trying to determine the efficacy of MAKO and does it really serve us well here in Carroll County. And I was pleasantly surprised going through all these items that they are, as you stated, they are very important issues. Um, I know that we can't bring all of them forward. Uh, there were some in particular, though, that I was uh, very uh, keen on, and but they may not make it. The first one was 24, this issue of public notices and monitor monitorizing public notices. This is something we've discussed here as a board before. The idea of putting it in a newspaper that people may or may not read, uh, putting public notices in places that people may not see them doesn't really seem to serve the, uh, the community and the county residents very well. So I, I really like that idea. Whoever came up with that one, um, I'm a big fan. The other two, though, that are even more important are the ones dealing with uh, Maryland Blueprint, which I think really is number four. And then yeah. I lost my place. I think, yep. I think maybe 27. 24 and 27, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, the ones dealing with blueprint, I, I just, again, my own personal opinion, but, you know, if, if MAKO can't, using its level of influence, if they can't move the needle on Blue Island blueprint, then something's wrong. And I, I would be really disappointed if they can't do that. So knowing that not everything can go forward and you've got more experience doing this than I do, uh, blueprint seems to be the number one uh, issue and it ironically it is one that does bring a lot of uh, diverse counties together I think mm -hmm. in the nature of the complaints and concerns now I, I appreciate and um, I also appreciate your you know especially the candidness about um, I don't say the validity of Michael but like you said the efficacy um, the strong benefit <clears throat> that I have found in my tenure is that all jurisdictions are at the table and you know being equal at the table and we know not all counties are equal you know overall because you got the very large counties but being at the table every voice is equal and there's more let's say more red than blue at the table um, so that's I don't want to say necessarily a good thing. In, in my view, it's a good thing, but uh, it, it allows us to focus our attention on things that matter more in line with our community, our Carroll County community. So, no, I appreciate that. Um, yes, definitely number four is, you know, I've triple asterisked that. So, but what are some other thoughts? I'd like to get, you know, all of us to kind of chime in. Oh, I will jump in for a quick second. So uh, you've got 27. Um, I think 25 would be one. I think we should look at the stormwater, wastewater over regulation. Um, you've got 24, uh, excuse me, 24 and 27 already noted. Um, uh, 
also interestingly enough I kind of was looking at number six because it's talking about maintaining local control over zoning and housing direction with infrastructure I thought that might be something we might want to consider and then obviously you've got four the transparency and education but I also thought since you know the state did pass the law I think we should look at number five with the uh, yep. cannabis tax revenue increase share yeah and there's a whole lot more to that than just the <clears throat> increased county share but the the all the laws associated with yes cannabis so I, I appreciate that um, okay gentlemen I think uh, actually just with the conversation we just had about fire and EMS number one I think is important um, different incentives uh, for fire and EMS um, so. uh, number I'm trying to remember what number it was 20 I think it was number 28 had to do with solar siting or giving counties local control over it. I mean, we just went through that whole process ourselves. Um, and, and, you know, we, I, I'd like to think that we kind of are a uh, model county as far as handling the uh, siting of solar developments. And so if there were a, a statewide um, flexibility for counties to have a greater say in where solar developments go, I think that's probably very important as well because uh, you know, part of the discussion that we'd had going through solar was, well, is the state going to come in and just make us do it anyways? Uh, and, and making sure that the state will not do that, I think, is probably uh, important. Mm -hmm. um, did we did we mention number 29 yet? Forget. No. No. Well, we should. Right page. Out of broadband. Right, broadband. Thank you. Um, you know, Commissioner Garen had pointed out or asked this morning for an update on uh, how we're getting along with uh, connectivity for our citizens. And uh, you know, I think that's certainly something worth pursuing as well. Resources, I mean, for. Okay. Um, but, but the, so yeah. I guess he might be able to answer this question though. But the problem is some of the things that we've mentioned as being important, there's a note here that says staff recommendation yeah. removed from list. Who is the staff? This it, it's the Mako staff, and, and that's part so, of the problem. No, no, it's it, actually it's not. What no. um, the the way it's shaped is you have the executive director, who is Michael Sanderson. Underneath Michael, he has a staff of about six. They attend that staff. They attend all of the committees, meetings, and subcommittee. They go to um, the uh, those that are recommending uh, the different bills. They carry the water for Mako, um, and then they get the information back from the um, committees on the um, where the specific bill is going to go. So if if there's like a bill that you know we really don't like, and they're going to say it ain't going anywhere. I mean, the, the, it's not going to get out of committee then we're like, okay, get that off. We don't, we want to pay attention to the things that we know are going to move forward. Um, and <clears throat> staff does not run the MAKO board. The MAKO board and all counties run staff. Um, you know, it, it, it really is. And they try really hard um, that to ensure that we're running the you know the the staff um, <clears throat> they focus all their attention in Annapolis this six folks and, and they're smart young folks um, they're all young uh, and they carry you know the the information um, but that's and they're broken into because you see different names of staff they're broken into uh, different categories or different you know um, subject areas subject areas um, and uh, that that's who staff is um, the last time we looked at this was I had a uh, a board meeting in Howard County I don't know last month or whenever it was that was the last time we looked at this with the staff um, this will be the next time down in uh, Mako and the next time after that I think will be um, in October to kind of continue to pare it down and then so the intent is by January it's hey here's the handful of things that we okay. must do so 
Okay, so, um, so I mean, so in your experience, the, you. the staff is actually looking at the what chances okay. those actually have in the general assembly, and that's how they're making the determination is to take coupled, them off the list or not. To coupled with the direction of the uh, county leadership, the jurisdictional leader, exactly. Um, because you know, it's like why waste your time if you yeah. know something's not coming out committee. Um, you know, we don't have those resources now, but that's pretty much it. Um, Thank you for explaining that to me, because you know, like Commissioner Garrett, I also had number 27 marked off as yeah. right. for, for blueprint, right? Right. And, um, and and while I understand that that you know there are some individuals who think it may not go anywhere, right? Um, I think even if we are able to have a discussion about it. Um, <laughs> whether or not uh, you know this may end up being one of those priorities just right. having the discussion about it I think yeah having discussions about all that I mean it makes sense <clears throat> pushing it through legislation if they know hey this was something that was brought over the last year or two years three years and it hasn't left committee but it's still a really important topic but why continue going down that rabbit hole if it's just not going to go anywhere let's focus on the things that really matter that's going like like cannabis you know you know there's so much issues with cannabis right now that we've got to get our hands around it uh in the usage of cannabis and the laws associated with cannabis um and all that i mean that's huge blueprint you know and the funding you know that's like like you said how are we going to resource um but and, and you're gonna <clears throat> see some of that also uh next week uh in some of the discussions uh hopefully you know we'll find time to meet some of the staff and uh if you know i i'm close by i'll definitely introduce you they're very very professional young adults that are doing a lot of hard work so um what uh what other things uh i've got a question yeah. um number four yeah um while we're going through blueprint and everything else they really want more accountability from the local school systems I think like past commissioners here there's great heartache that they can't control the spending but it's very transparent I mean you can you can see what they spend every month you can look at their blueprint port they just submitted um, this to me this is another unfunded mandate on the school system which is just going to cost us more money I, I don't quite understand um, and I understand that they've got to look at the probability of things passing in Annapolis but it's like they're afraid to question blueprint and blueprint funding but they want to question the local school systems yeah. funding well yeah that I know that's ridiculous yep I, that last comment makes a lot that of sense. What, that ain't what's going to cost us. Maybe, <coughs> that, 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 that isn't what cost us an extra <coughs> six million last right. year. Mm -hmm. Um. I, I agree, Joe. You were saying. Were you saying another? What? Oh no, I, I, I oh. brought up number uh, twenty-seven, and that got us into the discussion about uh, whether or not something was <coughs> efficacious in pursuing right. it. Um. But number five was also one that I had marked off because we eventually we will be dealing, I think, with a cascading effect from mm -hmm. cannabis use or from marijuana use and and having to uh, be able to account for that, even if it's with you know, trying to provide for emergency services or whatever. You know, I, I you know, so I, I certainly would support number five. <clears throat> you know, we've been having conversations about LMBs uh, recently, and one of the uh, legislative issues is moving the LMB to the Office of Children, um, moved from, and was, uh, Office of Crime Control Prevention in 2018, getting more visibility and more uh, kind of attention to how LMBs are run, which I agree with. Um, but um, what else, uh, Kenny, any? And this is not a be all, do all. I mean, we're gonna, have these conversations um, <clears throat> but as a as a team doing it openly during open admin you know makes sense but obviously you know while we're down there direct conversations we can have all day long so um, any other thoughts 
No? Okay. And honestly, every time I do these meetings, I mean, I try really hard to, no, I won't say really, I try hard to ensure that you're getting all the feedback that I'm getting and I'm receiving. Um, because that's that's important, you know that. And they're very voice. strong on looking at what's going to hurt either county funding or county spending versus yeah. the state. And and I I respect that. We get into some things, like for instance, they're worried about marijuana mm -hmm. funding because I think they recognize marijuana is here to stay. We can't do anything yep. about it, so let's make some money off of it, and that's okay. But then. When we get into, I guess we need to talk about, when we get into uh, veterans benefits, mm -hmm. retirees benefits, are we willing to give up some income to promote that? Or because MAKO, it's hard to argue that with them. They right. look like, oh, you know, this is going to cost the county's money, we don't want it. Well, right. maybe some things are worth costing us a little bit of money. I'm not sure what everybody thinks of that. A lot of that stuff tends to be in, a lot of that stuff in my experience tends to come out as enabling legislation. Right. That's where MAKO usually local tries. Control. Right, so that if a, if a local jurisdiction wants to give a tax credit, for example, yeah. You have the authority to do so, but yes. you know. So if they don't want it mandated, right? So if a if a delegate or senator comes out with a, yeah, they thou shalt make a. We usually try to change that to make it a yeah. enabling, so that each jurisdiction can uh, pick and choose for themselves. Yeah, in other words, so any tax. I mean, Mako is not um, tax friendly. In other words, um, and any time they try to throw a tax uh, across Mako across the bow, MAKO will push back and say no, even if it's a tax for a benefit that we believe is a valuable benefit like military retirement, you know. Uh, the governor added more to the military uh, veterans to try to keep veterans in place. <clears throat> MAKO was against it. I was not against that vote. I was like, hey, I disagree, but they want to make it an opt-out type of a process so um, again that's the benefit of being more red than blue at the table <laughs> you know to be honest yep. um, and uh, yeah so Mako is not um, a tax I won't say tax friendly but we, we don't look at it that way so they're, they're not and they uh, I'm surprised how conservative that group can be, yep. but they're also very realistic on what mm -hmm. can get passed in Annapolis yeah. and what can't. Whether right. you love it or you don't, it yeah. doesn't have a snowball's chance. That's right, and that's and that's what I was I was talking to Mike about was, yes. um, you know, the committees, understanding committees, whether it's going to leave committee, or not leave committee. How long has it been in committee? How long has it been, you know, years going through something? Um, because there's some goofy stuff out there, but okay, got it. I think I got a good uh, understanding, and I'll let you know how that conversation goes next week um, or the week after. Um, one to one, you come on up. Uh, is there anything else for open admin? <sighs> okay. Hello, Wanda. Hello. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Okay, August 14th, <clears throat> next week, we have nothing scheduled. Commissioner Gordon will be at the Planning and Zoning Tuesday morning. And then MAKO does start, Maryland Association Counties, where uh, Commissioner Gordon, Gary, and Kyler, and I will be attending. Commissioner Vigliotti will be at the Farm Museum Board meeting. And he will then attend the Carroll County College Board of Trustees because Commissioner yes, Kyler will not. be down in Mako. He's covering for me. Right? Yep. I do my best. <laughs> Thursday, Mako continues with the four. Same thing with Friday. Um, and then same with Saturday. And there will be a, you know, options on all of us or you, whether you stay through Saturday or not. Um, what what's go ahead of, yeah. of us going yeah um, a lot of people book out after the crab feed or yep. maybe before it on Friday yeah. to, mm -hmm. to 
do you guys think you're going to be there Saturday morning or probably not? So, um, and not I, 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 no, it's okay. I, I can share with you. My expectation is that uh, I will, well, I will be there through Saturday. I expect Roberto also will be there through Saturday. Um, Saturday, uh, I think there's a one more MAKO board meeting, and it's also an uh, opportunity for the governor to do a address, you know, uh, and speaking opportunity. That's kind of where it stops. So it really stops around noon on Saturday. Um, a lot of people do leave on Friday because you're spending one more night just to hear, you know, one more thing, and then that's it. So a lot of folks do get out of there um, Friday after the crab feast. Uh, so and it's probably yeah. still yeah reasonable to have that room Saturday night because sure. you're not going to leave till Friday night 9 p.m. So yeah, so we you shouldn't yeah. change our rooms. I don't think, but nope. and we're debating because of a church breakfast yeah. whether to leave or not, and I. Mm -hmm. I might be winning the debate. We might get to stay. But so. <laughs> I was curious what everybody else was doing. Cause it, and that's, you know, you, you do have the room that, that night, so you could stay, obviously, through Saturday and <clears throat> enjoy your opportunity being down there. Um, and and uh, yeah, I don't know what you guys saw in Cambridge, but I think at least I have a copy of the tax exempt, the hotel. They already have it. Yeah, but they they did in Cambridge too, and they still charged us. But yeah, um, which is their problem. But it's then right. a, people's problems here when we get back to get yeah. it reversed. Yeah, it's my on, it's on it's on everyone's credit county credit card too, just in case. So, yeah. Um. And then, uh, yeah, the schedule during Mako where there's going to be opportunities where the four of us will be. Uh, together should also be on your calendars because there are a few events where we will all be together uh, for uh, a dinner engagement and other activities. Um, we've been told how to dress. We've been told how to dress. Bonnie tells us how to dress. Um, Wednesday there's very little going on so the white polo shirt is not usually as necessary. Uh, unfortunately, well, I have to wear because I'm going to a, an event. but. Yeah, those white shirts are just not the most durable. So anyway, um, after that Sunday, you got you being Commissioner Kyler has the podcast on Monday 21st. Nothing scheduled. I have the chamber breakfast on Tuesday. Really on Tuesday. Looking forward to that. And uh, Commissioner Kyler will be attending as well. Um, there will be a health on wheels ribbon cutting um, at the health department. Commissioner Gordon and Gurn are scheduled to uh, participate that at 930. On Wednesday, Board of Education and State Delegation meeting where we will all be attending over at the public schools uh, conference room. On Thursday, August 24th, we will be going into open session. And we will be talking about the approval of spending with the credit rating agencies. Uh, Ms. Hobbs uh, from Comptroller, our FY23 operating budget transfer for the uh, Carroll County Public Schools. We will have a public hearing regarding the amendments to Chapter 158 of the Zoning Codes. Um, Land Resource Management will be facilitating us through that. We will have uh, a briefing discussion and expectation of a decision on an option to purchase the Nicholas and Sharon Dawson property through our county program into Ag Preservation. Um, chapter 170 Construction Codes, DPW will be walking us through that. And then a, an approval to purchase some Dell semi-rugged computers. And the Sheriff's Department will present uh, that at 1 p.m. Oh, there's at Fort Meade, the uh, Community Covenant Council, uh, which is just for the good of the group. It's uh, Fort Meade, 
uh, doing a uh, bringing all the jurisdictions that surround Fort Meade and for us to commit to taking care of our military community. Um, Friday, Saturday, nothing scheduled. Commissioner Gordon has the podcast on Sunday. So how'd I do? Any final comments for the good of the group? Just one thing um, was talked about um, earlier. We, we uh, the county, and we'll put this in a press release, uh, the county will be extending the landfill hours for debris, for folks to bring debris to the landfill on Saturday until 7 p.m. and Sunday from 8 to 1. We're not usually open at all on Sunday. So we'll put a press release out and okay, uh, call great. the details. But that was the You mentioned that was uh, debris, like uh, trees, debris. trees, trees things like that. Oh, I apologize. Yeah. Was it the, was it both locations or just the one? Uh, just the Northern sorry. landfill. Oh, yeah. just northern? Oh. Yeah. Just green stuff. <laughs> just the green stuff. When the brown stuff. Or brown stuff, yeah, good point. Okay. We're still set for 2 p.m. We are set. Or are, are we going to try to do anything between now and then or just. Or we could do it after. after that? You tell us. We just close now. We can yes. Just close the meeting. Okay, I need a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Motion, second. Any discussion? Seeing here, none. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.